And hello everybody and welcome to the new hour for the live stream, 5 o'clock p.m. We hope that people enjoy this slightly earlier time frame. I was trying to accommodate some of the folks that I keep seeing uh, viewing this live stream from Europe and I realized how late they are staying up because I used to live in Europe. So I know what that's like. And so, yeah, I would not want to stay up all night and uh, listen to somebody yap about printers. Well, maybe I would. Uh, you never know. <laughs> anyway, let me quickly say howdy to everybody who's here. They were here quite early this afternoon. George Gab was here. I think it was first in line, uh, 100, 100 degrees Fahrenheit where he lives in Texas. Way too hot. Today was 81 very nice here. We got a Thomas R. from Germany. Got Eli, of course, here from the North Carolina area, I believe. Thomas R. It says everyone's early, and yes, they were. Charles Verbruggen from Belgium. Leo Walters from PA. Cal Johnson. I haven't had Cal Johnson. Were you here last week? I remember you, one of my one of my most devoted viewers here. Richard Park, only 94 in Charleston, South Carolina. Anthony Petit from Killeen, Texas is here. I bet you it's hot there as well. 1066 Internet from the UK is here from Hastings. Eli says, I finally got his P my PC Signature Edition inks. Still have a decent amount of the older inks to burn through until I switch. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Rob Van Gelder from Amsterdam is here. And then I said howdy to everybody. We got 24 people now already. Amos, uh, Amos Goldberg from Richmond, Virginia. No, Harold Goldberg from Richmond, Virginia. I'm ahead of myself. Amos Canzoni from Cool Pacific Northwest. Yes, that's the area that never really gets hot. I don't think so. Not like here in the Mid East and you know the South. Bernhard Moore from Southington, Connecticut, and Rubble Cohen, Sonoma County, California. Near 100 degrees there as well. Holy cow! Anyway, today was beautiful here. Um, I got up sort of early, not too bad, and then my wife and I we love to watch YouTube and just go through silly videos, you know top 10 this, the worst 40, blah, 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 and all of this fun stuff. That's what you do when you're retired and you're bored. <laughs> but anyway, later on today, we had to go over to Nathan's house to help him. Well, here's what's going on. They had a, a kind of a mini gymnasium in their basement, which no one has used as far as I remember. So his playroom was in one of their sunrooms. These are additions that Mr. Mooney Sr. had added to the house, making it quite a large house. And so that was getting a little bit cramped and just hard to keep clean. So I think they went out to Ikea the other day and bought a bunch of Billy bookcases and all kinds of other types of bookcases, cabinets and such, the kind that allow you to put those little square cubbyhole type drawers made out of a canvas. And uh, we've been spending the last couple of days reorganizing, painting, and doing all sorts of beautifying uh, things to that basement. That's his new play area. No more upstairs. And so tomorrow we're having a, a going away party for a really close friend of my daughter who went to high school with her. And uh, I believe they did. I think they were teenagers when they were hanging around. I don't know whether they actually went to high school together. So don't quote me. Anyway, that doesn't matter. There I go again. So they're moving to Pennsylvania. And so remember, my daughter is like 47 right now. So a few years they have been friends. So they're throwing a big going away party. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and videotape. And I'm going to do like little uh, interviews with people so they can give their best wishes. I'm going to compile a like a slideshow with video. And also, I'm going to do a couple of droney shots with my Bebop 2 power. I will get the whole group outside. They have a huge, huge front yard. So I will do one of these zoom out type shots. And that will end the video. 
And so that should be really nice. I'll make a DVD so that they can play it at home. I'll also give them a video file that they can just load up on the computer and view it straight up without having to worry about menus. All right, so that is the weekend, weekend's plans already you know, in place. I have no time to do anything else. I did manage early this morning to do a video where I talked about really what I consider a design problem, but I think there's a compromise there that they have come up with. We'll discuss that a little bit. I think I touched on that last week. And um, it really does help to do what I am going to show you and what I already showed you on that video, if you caught it. It went up this morning. So if you haven't seen it, grab it before you go to sleep tonight and take a look at it because I show you a very simple way to solve this problem because all of these printers have the same problem that I am experiencing and many, many other people have experienced as well. It's, to me, it's just inconceivable that they don't do something to address this. They could easily do this by simply redesigning the what? The exit tray, the paper tray. Um, black and white printing, people are still having problems with that. How can that be? Really, how can that be? Again, I will do what may end up being a couple of videos, and the only opportunity I'll have to do this kind of stuff next week, because we have Nathan from morning until evening, every day for the next five days. Monday will be my wife's birthday, so we will be going to go see a movie and then we'll go out to eat at lunch and then come back home. And basically we'll just play the rest of the afternoon. Maybe we'll go for a walk. But by that time, maybe five o'clock when he gets picked up, uh, maybe after I eat dinner, I will go ahead and compile a, a, a pretty, a con what was the word? Will you cover everything? Uh, boy, I just lost that word. Anyway, comprehensive, that's it. See what happens when you speak two languages. It's a little difficult. But comprehensive video where I will try to cover, like, what could you possibly be doing wrong to get a bad black and white? Meaning, and for me, that just simply means a black and white that has color on it. It's not neutral. How could that be happening? How? Because if you have done, as I have been preaching from, you know, many many, many years ago, is to set up your printer. And of course, I'm going to beat this dead horse until it comes back to life again. Set up your printer and certify it. No one does that, right? Nobody. They immediately start printing their own images. And those are not certified images. Your images are not. Sorry. Neither are mine. You have to first establish that your printer can produce a perfect rendition you know what I'm going to be showing you. you. Of course you do. This. You got to be able to reproduce this image. Now, don't go by what this video here is showing. This puppy is neutral. So, I'm having, you know, the, the, the best opportunity here to test my printer. Why? I got common images all the way around a black and white image. Okay? baby faces different ethnicity so you can check to see whether those skin tones are correct or not this upper one here is just like a like a um, still life of many items that are usually used as a standard to to test your images as you photograph them in certain different you know locations and conditions you use these types of devices here color checker card you need that to determine whether the colors are correct all sorts of things out of gamma colors okay some printers can print some areas of out of gamma colors and some cannot a sunset what you expect a sunset to look like this actually is like solidified lava, this one here. And of course, our favorite one is the strawberries. If the strawberries look good enough to eat and that middle image is neutral, and most importantly, black to white is neutral linearly throughout 
at the complete range. That's really the most important thing here. Unless something is ridiculously wrong and you know you're able to produce a linear rendition of a black zero 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 all the way to what basically is just a paper base without ink. Why aren't your black and whites come out neutral? Because you're doing something wrong. That's what it is. You're doing something wrong and Unfortunately, when folks ask for help, they just simply don't know what to include. Oh, my! I'm having a problem with my black and whites being magenta. What could it be? Please help me. They're coming out magenta because you're creating the condition to produce a magenta neutral, or what would, should be a neutral, what I meant to say was monochrome image. It could be greenish. It could be yellowish. Whatever you're doing is causing that because believe me, if you're sending this image to the printer, this image is perfect. Okay, there's nothing wrong with this image unless you manipulated it. Okay, we go back every, every Saturday evening, we discuss the same thing over and over and over. I hope that everyone that's here already understands that concept of certification of your printer with one of these. That way, when you get a different result, it means that that image is the culprit or your monitor is the culprit, okay? Imagine if you had, you know, a pH meter, and we use that in the lab all the time, and we have to calibrate it to certain settings. Ex two extremes, acid, in other words, below point below 7.0, and the opposite extreme, which would be alkaline, say up to like 13.0. So you have two control liquids, and then you have a neutral pH liquid. And then you check the accuracy of your pH meter with those three controls. This is your control. Now, when you have calibrated your pH meter, so that it reads the correct acidity level and the correct alkalinity level and indeed identifies your neutral control fluid as being 7.0, then you know that your meter is working correctly. That way, when I check my coffee and it gives me a certain reading, I know that it is correct because really those two extremes are about as extreme as you will ever find as you are working in the lab, checking pH conditions of your reagents. Okay, the same thing here. This is correct. Okay, this includes extremes. Okay, this includes everything you need to tell if your printer is producing the correct rendition. Now, the magic comes, or the important part comes, when you this pops out of the printer and you look at it, Use your, you know, nice strong lighting, okay, D50 preferably for viewing prints. We'll talk about what D65 is and what you use that for in a second. So D50 lighting, 500 lumens, you look at it and you go, dang, that's perfect. My Pro 100 is kicking butt, okay? And you take that to the computer and you have your image, your standard image open in Photoshop or whatever you use, and you go, wait a second. Remember, you gotta light this with the same lighting you use when you viewed it, when you examined it, when you evaluated it. So you put it off to the side and you light that. Do not spill any of the light onto your screen, okay? You wanna look at your image unadulterated, what the, ski the screen is actually producing for you and they should match, they need to match, not in the brilliancy of an LCD backlit screen, but you're looking for color accuracy and overall luminance, okay? So if you can see a luminance level that matches this reflective luminance level and the colors match, your black to white is neutral, okay? And your black to white is neutral here. That means your monitor does not require calibration. Oh, if you get that condition out of the box, I have a suggestion for you. Go to your local 7-Eleven and buy a lottery ticket because you're very, very lucky, okay? 
What normally happens is the opposite. You will need to calibrate your monitor. And that's when you calibrate it to D65. So monitors need to calibrate. Don't ask why. Just do it. D65 for your monitor. That's your Y point. D50 for profiles and for viewing your prints. Okay? Take that to the bank. D65 for monitor calibration. D50 for viewing your prints. And so once you get your calibrated monitor to match this, then you were all set. Basically, now you have really eliminated two possibilities of errors, right? The unaltered image printed perfectly. Write that down. That's one. Check one. Now, your monitor output of that image, display, presentation, matches what my printer put out. Check two. Okay? Now, the only thing you have to get over, the only hurdle you need to jump over now is to get your images to match what the printer outputs. So now, since you have matched the standard image to the output that you receive from your Pro 100 or P800 or whatever printer you're using, preferably not just an all-in-one printer, but something, something of a photo-oriented type nature, Something with at least six colors. That's what you need. Anything less than that, you will have a lot of problems getting that nice, neutral, linear black and white print. That I understand. It's just basically the, you know, the printer is incapable of producing a perfectly linear result that is neutral. It just can't do it. I'll tell you why. For instance, something like the uh, Epson 1400 or 1430. They don't have but one black ink. That's it. No grays. There are some iterations of that family of printers by Epson and also by Canon that have included one gray. They had to el eliminate one of the light magentas or cyan. I don't know which one. In order to make room because they only have six channels on those printheads. And you have six, you know, cartridges of ink. So if you remove one of those light versions of magenta or cyan, you can then replace it with, say, a, a light gray. And that will help tremendously. Your gradations, the, the gradual transition of tonalities. If you don't have that, what happens is that two adjacent tones that were very gradually different will show up as a band. It, it will have like a like a little wall between the two tones. It cannot produce that, that in-between tone, okay, that you should have there. And you will not see that on your monitor, but you will see it in print. And that's that banding problem that occurs where you have, like for example, a sky that has a very super gradual change in density where it's brighter on the horizon and then it gets gradually dark, you may end up with some banding, okay? Now, the higher the bit rate you work in, the less likely you will have banding because you're using a lot more colors. Remember, um, a three-channel image, RGB, has from 0 to 255. If you multiply that times itself three times to the power to the third power is something in the neighborhood of like 16 million plus shades and colors that you could theoretically display on your monitor. Can the printer do that? Of course not. The printer can never achieve that level, okay? But it will come close. So the higher the quality of the initial image, if your image is already showing banding, nothing can help you, my friend. People say, you know, just blur it a little bit. Well, why would you want to do that? Yeah, if your banding shows up in your monitor, it's too late. It's there. It's there to be printed beautifully by your printer. But if you don't have any banding and your printer produces banding, then you have a problem. It could be just what I explained, where you just don't have enough gamut, enough ability to produce very, very gradual renditions of colors 
and transitions and you may get like an abrupt change at the edge of one of those zones and you will have to literally like measure it to see what the density levels are so yeah um once you get that once you get your monitor to match that output then you start working on your images do everything you can everything possible to not degrade your images and i suggest if you have the ability to do so work from raw okay do not open your raw like with photoshop this is why i never use photoshop any longer you have to open your raw images in photoshop it uses a raw converter and then you have to export it out as a psd or a tip you already degraded it yeah you did okay no matter what anyone will say you just degraded your image Open it in something like Lightroom. Lightroom is cheap. It's like ten bucks a month. Okay. Oh, I don't. I don't want to subscribe. Well, that's that's the way we have to do it right now. Or use a a a you know basically a standalone raw type editor. Many of them exist out there, and you guys know what they are. Q Image will allow you to do some editing, certain extent as well and they allow you to just open the raw image it will show you a rendition of itself of that data on your monitor and whatever you edit is still sort of in that realm it hasn't been converted to some other file format officially and of course as you guys know when you close the program when you close q image when you close a session you did on lightroom it remembers everything you did and yet the original file is untouched, unharmed, unadulterated. If you work in Photoshop, you have to basically save two files, one raw and one to whatever format you exported it out to. Why? Wow, you're now taking up twice the amount of room in your hard drive. If you don't have enough hard drive space, that could be a problem. So working with raw, with editors that allow you to work directly off of that file, is really the best way to go. So now you're working with your images, highest quality possibility images. Again, um, you could work in Pro Photo RGB inside Lightroom, basically about the same type of uh, color space. So when you get done editing, you can be pretty much assured that what you're going to send out to your printer has not degraded in any way. And that's the worst thing you could do. I've heard so many people, oh, I will go ahead and export out to JPEG. What? Why would you do that? Why in the heck would you do that? To me, that's like giving me an apple that's hollow inside. Yeah, it still looks like an apple, but when you bite it, there's nothing but air in it. Imagine that. Think of it that way. With throw, you're throwing away 90% of the image data when you, when you basically transform it to JPEG. Now, visually, you may not see the difference, but here's the catch. Raw can actually allow you to bring out shadow detail, to bring down burnt, what appears to be burnt out or over the top of the hill or the cliff highlights so that they now have detail. JPEG cannot do that. Okay, the JPEG cannot do that. It just cuts it off. Okay, where a raw image allows you to do that. So to me, there's no other way that I would go ahead and, and, and edit anything. No way. So here's what happened. I did that, I did that that standard image. Here it is. This is what PC signature edition OEM inks. No, OEM ICM, not OEM inks. The OEM ICM. So that way, or ICC. Okay. Canon calls them ICM. Anyway, so if I can get this. Oh my God, with the OEM profile for this Canon matte paper, what does that tell you about the inks? Really, think about it for about two seconds. What does that tell you? If I get a perfect result, and I bet you that if I go ahead and reload OEM inks on my Pro 100 and run one of those, and I put it side by side, You'll probably pick the PC Signature Edition one because, simply put, the blacks are better, okay? Especially on matte media, which normally is not something that I recommend doing because it just really doesn't perform that well. 
on map paper. I remember the old days when I had older printers, older generation printers, and I was using some artsy type texture paper and printing color images. They would just come out dull and just, just yucky. I mean, they would be just plain looking instead of having that punch that I saw on my monitor. But then again, it could have been my monitor as well. That was back in the days when I really did not know the the importance of monitor calibration. Out of the box should be perfect. That's what that's what everybody would tell me. But of course, we know better now. A black and white should look neutral. And I'm looking at it on my screen here. My screen is really, the little monitor there is not calibrated. So it doesn't look neutral there, but I hope it comes across as neutral to you guys. Because it is, it is dead on neutral. I mean, I cannot detect any kind of color shift at all. So that's it. Once you get your standard image, and you really shouldn't have to do too much to achieve that. Simply put, just print it. Print it on a Pro 100 and a Pro 10, Pro 1, Pro 1000, PA 100, any of those printers. Just let the driver control color initially when you're learning, when you're starting up. Just do that. Why do you want to make things confusing? As they can be extremely confusing. Color management can be simple or it can be rocket science if you choose to make it so. It doesn't have to be that way. If I choose Pro Luster, I'm going to show you a couple of these. Pro Luster. I choose Pro Luster on the driver. And then I go to Color, Intensity, Manual Adjustment. I always forget that. Click on that little box, open up the matching tab. The middle choice is uh, ICM. Click on ICM. Guess what happens? The driver will print using the semi-gloss or pro luster ICC profile. Yeah. So it's just like using your 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 regular color managed workflow. Okay, normally you would have to set matching to none and then load up the profile for that paper in your editor and tell it to control color and use blah 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 profile. If you just choose the paper type, this only works with Canon papers and only Epson papers, only the OEM papers. Those paper choices have been already basically set up for you to print correctly because it will search for the matching ICC profile and use it to render its colors, the colors on that image that you're sending to it. Now, the reason I did this, and I show you uh, this in a second, because if you saw my earliest video that I just did today, this morning, I covered the problem that occurs when you print borderless. Uh oh, <clears throat> borderless printing. I know people love to print borderless because it just looks so classy, really. No, it doesn't really look that classy to me. It looks like a cheap 4x6 from the drugstore. And that's really the very first time people started printing borderless, okay? Because they saw what the one-hour machine can produce, and they say, hey, gee, I would love for my printer to be able to produce little cute 4x6s. I'm sorry, I'm being sarcastic here. But it has its, its reasons. And so that's why, if you go very, very early, the advent of inkjet printers that people began to use for imaging, there was no such thing as borderless back then. But the demand was there, so Epson and Canon decided, yeah, it's about time we incorporate this because of the high demand. Except they knew. They knew it was going to create problems right off the button, right, right off the bat. And the reason is, is simply the, the mechanical transporting of the paper. And for single cut sheet type printers, as opposed to a roll printer, and we'll touch on that in a second as well. As I discuss in the video, and you can go back and look at it because it's, it's a little bit more in detail, but I'm going to go ahead and cover some of the problems that occur. Take a look at the inside of your printer when you get off here tonight. Locate the platen. Notice that there are star wheels or pizza wheels and little rubber roller, rollers. There's also a, it, it is also adjustable. Okay, it's, a, it's sort of spring loaded. So when the print, the paper print emerges from your printer, 
Okay, so this is the front of the printer. The printhead begins from here and travels across from your right or the paper's left because the orientation of the paper, this will be the top. This will be a portrait oriented image. This becomes the leading edge. This is what's going to emerge first. So as that emerges and is just going under that plate and before it goes under the plate, actually, the printhead could possibly hit that corner because nothing is keeping that corner flat. Unless you have a Pro 1000 with vacuum assisted paper transport, most printers, if you have the slightest bit of curl, that corner may be up a little bit. This corner doesn't seem to matter too much, but certainly this one, the entry edge of the paper. And boom, the printhead will strike that. That's what we call it a head strike. And then we'll smear some of the some of the gunk under the printhead nozzle onto your, the surface of your nice, beautiful print. We don't want that to happen, right? So that happens when you print edge to edge, as I did here. This is 8 by 10. This is an image that's actually rectangular in nature. It is not a 4 to 5 ratio. So when I printed it edge to edge, it expanded it enough for the leading edge and the trailing edge to be beyond the edges of the paper. And the print started to print. It did a beautiful job because I used the Pro 1000, okay? Some other printer without vacuum advance may not have performed as nicely as this. Now, what can happen upon about 80% done, okay, is that the rear edge, and we'll get to the, the, the good part in a second, the trailing edge or the rear edge is really not supported. Why is that? Well, if you have a very big piece of paper where there's still about, you know, 80% of the paper behind, actually still on the, on the, the feed tray, whether it is manual or the top regular one, you still have paper in there. So everything is basically kept in place and flat. As the paper begins to emerge, gravity takes hold of it. And the reason that becomes an, a problem is because of the way the trays, the exit trays or the take-up trays are designed. Take a close look at your printer. That, that exit tray is about three quarters of an inch to one inch or more below the surface or the level, I should say, the level where the print begins to emerge from the platen, the, the front edge of the platen. As it emerges, gravity begins to take hold of it. And as you can see, you see what happens? Okay. See that? It just dropped a whole bunch. If I have nothing supporting that base piece of paper, guess what happens to the other end? Especially when nothing is supporting this edge any longer because it's at its last inch trying to print to the very edge, right? That's what you want. Borderless. You're trying to print that to that very edge and there's nothing there to support it. In fact, there's hardly anything to push the paper out because those rollers may not be enough, okay? If you print with, for instance, if I had printed this with an equal leading and trailing edge border, then I would be done printing. Basically, I would have been done printing right here. The rest of the paper that is white would still be supported. And the print just gets ejected. Nothing bad happens. But I'm trying to do basically the impossible to print to the very edge of the paper. That means I would have to have an invisible inch of paper to provide support. Well, that invisible inch is not there. There's nothing to support it. The front of the paper drops due to gravity. The rear of the paper rises and it gets stuck, struck by the printhead. The least that could happen is that you get, if it's minimal, you'll get a difference in density. Some people get a huge band right at the end where it's just a slightly different density. Okay. And on areas such as this very dark edge, you will see that immediately. The worst that could happen 
besides a head strike and a smear, is that the printhead literally hits the end and it will shift it, shift it literally this way. And so then the paper continues to feed, trying to get out, and it's now shifted maybe five degrees. Well, that's, that just ruined the print, didn't it? Well, guess what, folks? That happened to me on that river stone satin rag. Have you wondered why you see the edge of the house right here? You see how there's more of the house than on the opposite side? See how there's less of that house? Yeah, I had that problem. I had to trim it. It literally shifted it over. And so I immediately knew that's that's the reason. And I went ahead and printed another one where I was doing what should be incorporated in all printers. And what is that? Oh, by the way, here's another one. Printed edge to edge with not a single problem. I'll tell you how I achieved that, okay? It's very simple. In fact, it's, it's just stupid simple. Take a look at your prints as they emerge and decide how much space is there from the bottom of the, the bottom surface of the paper. Oh, let's stop right there. Let me show you something incredibly important. When paper is created at the mill, of course, something like this, yeah, it's made with paper, with wood fibers maybe, or whatever kind of fibers. Notice how easily it bends in this direction. This is the 8x10. This is straight out of a packet of 8x10 paper. Notice how it just naturally, it just wants to curl in this direction. You see that? Along the 8-inch side, not this way. Paper has grain. Okay, paper has grain just like wood. A sheet of thin wood has grain. You can bend it along the grain easy. You can steam it and bend it along the grain, but it's a lot more difficult to bend it against the grain. Okay, so notice this is a lot more difficult to bend this way than it is this way. So this paper, naturally, since this is the top of it, tends to curl down. Okay, and that, that characteristic alone will probably eliminate any, any probability of a head strike in the leading edge when you're printing borderless, okay? If it's curling the opposite way, and some papers do that, take a close look at your papers. Look at a single sheet of it. You will get a head strike more than likely unless you counter curl that front two corners, okay? The same thing with the rear. This is naturally kind of curling downward. So it's not going to really be affected too much by printing borders on this. I didn't say that the problems were universal, were going to happen every single time. They will happen on certain types of paper. Now let's look at that good old Riverstone paper. Okay, this is made out of a 100% rag. Okay, and as the name implies, rag is made out of rags, processed rot. Rag fibers, which basically probably mean cotton, okay? This has no grain, okay? This bends just as stiffly in, in either direction, okay? And remember when I told you this is coated on both surfaces. So out of the box, this was sprayed already, by the way. So out of the, that's why it's kind of a, not laying perfectly flat. I only sprayed one side. So that produces the counter curl. So out of the box, it is, I mean, dead flat. You can lay it on a, on a glass sheet and none of the corners lift up. The problem is the weight. This is, paper, this is much heavier paper than that other simple Canon, you know, Pro Luster. So it will cause that lifting of the rear or the trailing edge more and more pronounced than on a lighter weight paper that has the grain running in the correct condition or direction to basically pretty much guarantee you will not have a head strike. Yeah, you will hear this was actually shifted over quite a bit. It did hit it, boom, it shifted it, and I kept hearing scraping noises when he was printing now. 
what did I do? Figure out how much distance you have from the bottom surface of your paper to the top surface of your exit tray, even internally. Some, like the Pro 1000, the actual physical exit tray is about 3 sixteenths of an inch lower than the surface. If you stick your hand inside the printer, it's actually a little lower. So what you do is you get a box of anything, box of paper, 50 sheet box of paper. Try to come up with a height, magazines, whatever you can find, okay? Set up something, I don't know, get a, get a phone book and rip out enough pages until you get a specific thickness. Piece of wood, whatever you need, as long as it is flat. Create an environment so when the print exits out, it never flexes down, okay? It maintains that flat level trajectory, okay? That means there will be no uh, pivoting force that will raise that edge up. You will have a perfect result. And that's what I had on this side. This side was bad. This side was good. What I had to do was to put a box underneath. And I used to do that all the time. I don't know why I stopped doing it. I used to do that all the time because really, really, it works. And it's so stupid simple that, again, most problems are caused by simple conditions or reasons. And you can solve those same problems, again, with just a simple a, a fix, if you will. So why do they put that trace so low? And somebody told me, oh, it's to accommodate multiple print jobs. Well, how many prints does it take to create, to fill a gap of three quarters of an inch to one inch? Come on, man, that's more paper than you can possibly load. And why would you want to do that on a nice Pro 1000? And Pro 1000 is to print single prints. Get this through your head, folks. I know some people may not like this, but printers like the Pro 1000, the P800, higher-end printers, it's one-off type jobs. You print one image. You look at it. You baby it as it comes out. Have you ever seen those videos of people just, just gazing at their prints as they come out? Yeah, that's what you need to do one at a time okay i do not need a you know exit tray for paper that is three quarters to one inch below the level of the paper coming out simply because they think i might actually want to print 50 sheets of paper at one time and walk away really are you crazy i hope you're not and these are the engineers that have come up with this reason and for Whatever the reason, they think that's what we need or want. And really, every single day of the week, I come across these questions. Results of head strikes. And I, I have to always eventually ask, because again, most people just don't have the, the ability to ask the proper question and provide the required a list of details because they just don't know what's important and what isn't. All they see is that, hey, I got a smudge on my print. Why did this happen? Where did it come from? Okay. Do I have a leak? Well, not really. You don't have a leak. It's just a head strike in your paper. Oh, did you print borderless? After about three replies back and forth, of course. Oh, yeah, I did. I forgot to tell you that. Well, you know, maybe that's the first thing you should have told me. But then again, that's not something that comes to mind. So I understand that fully. That's why I don't want to, you know, come across as a ass. But that's why I do this. I want to make sure that I cover these, these simple reasons for, like, print problems. And again, remember, gosh, you don't want to be ruining prints that cost you, like, five bucks each to produce. Yeah. Some of these larger prints on good papers, on OEM ink. Yeah, they do cost that much to produce. So you don't want to do that. Uh, a buck fifty per ml for OEM, that's about what it costs for OEM ink. You need about two ml per print, maybe three ml for a big print. 
A big sheet of paper may cost you about $5, so you may end up paying like $7 for that one print. You better be selling it high enough to, to you know, make up for that, that loss of revenue. So anything you can do to prevent the possibility of you having to reprint this, because you're not going to trim off that bad part. No, your image is carefully, you know, cropped. It is what you want on paper. You don't want to cut off one and a half inches because of this edge problem. And remember, when you choose borderless, the reason that pop-up screen comes up with that warning is there. They're covering their butt. See? Why, A, absolutely, they know it's going to be detr detrimental. Not only the possibility of something like I just explained happening, but it just sprays, you know, ink fumes all over your inside of your printer. My Pro 10 has to be cleaned all the time, and I don't even print borderless. And even just regular printing will dirty up the internal surfaces of your printer. So you got to be careful. Don't choose a, a condition that will further gunk up the inside of your printer because it does accumulate and it will end up causing marks, unwanted marks and so forth. Now, another form of scuff mark or, or smudge can occur and it's not necessarily due to a corner being, you know, curly or your paper not lying perfectly flat on the trailing edge or anything like that. Some papers, in fact, I should I should just say this very paper right here. Here's another one of my prints. This is front and back. This is the back. This is the front. Both surfaces print perfectly. If you spray both sides, you get rid of that little roller transport mark that is almost invisible. But it happens during the coating process. The reason they coat it on both sides is to keep this paper, which is made out of 100% rag, nice and flat. Okay. Who knows? They don't know how long you're going to keep it stored in a box. So they want to make sure that if it absorbs any kind of moisture from the ambience, it's not going to curl in one direction. If they coated it in just one side, you would end up with a uncoated rag rear surface that would just soak up moisture like a sponge okay so that's why they coat it they want stability and they want this paper to lay nice and flat and by the way i've heard a hundred year longevity on this paper okay that doesn't mean your prints made with cheap dye inks are going to last a hundred years it means the paper itself has the ability to not change for the next hundred years okay i just heard that so why would you print with cheap inks then on something that has by itself 100 year longevity this qualifies as archival basically this paper by its lonesome self so use yeah precision color second you know signature edition but then spray your prints protect them and you will maybe not reach 100 years but you will certainly quadruple, quintuple, maybe 10, 15, 20 times increase the expectancy of that finished print. And you will have done it with excellent inks that match OEM and even surpass it in some aspects on a great paper that has by itself a very long, long lifespan. So, I mean, can you, can you say anything about this this is a great image and again look at the back that's back this is front i could do this all day long if i didn't show you the letters here f and back and b you would never know the difference okay so something like this that has a border on it this paper on a regular printer okay see that three quarters of an inch border on this bad, bad girl right here that will allow the print to finish printing and still provide support so it doesn't literally lift up okay it'll lift up after it's done printing but to eliminate any kind of chance of this happening go ahead and use that little trick just get a box of paper 
it seems that the 50 sheet papers um i don't have the box here with me but it's about that thick okay three quarters of an inch thick that provides the perfect amount of support oh i'll have to babysit my print yes you will you'll have to babysit your print but if you're printing important work why not babysit it devote some love and care to that print because when it emerges and it is perfect then the only thing that will go wrong is if you screw it up afterwards through handling or mishandling so make sure that you do that it's a very simple fix and what that should have been implemented what they should do this is what they should do sure if they want you to have sufficient room for say 50 sheets of paper to accumulate and i could see if i'm using like the pro 100 and i'm printing you know 50 four by sixes for the classroom that i support you know some of the classrooms at my wife's old school yeah okay i can dig that i can walk away i can load up you know 35 images on on lightroom print and i go upstairs and watch a show and come back and everything is done and stacked up yeah you couldn't do that if the tray was at the level that a single sheet of paper comes out i've been told that's the reason except that type of uh, feature should never be incorporated on a fine art photo printer they should know that we intend to print no more than just a couple okay couple maybe three or four at once okay even some of these papers if you put three or four sheets you may have feeding problems yeah you may so i always do one at a time one at a time unless i'm using a cheapo paper like i don't call it i call it cheapo but really it's resin coated nice plasticky paper like this but when you use a fine art paper such as this you don't want to load up 10 sheets of this this paper is coated on both sides it could actually be a little bit sticky depending on the humidity you can end up with one or two sheets or even more trying to fit through the printer you just blew several dollars maybe ten dollars worth of paper you don't want to do that so one at a time is what i recommend i know i know you have to sit there and wait but that's that's really very small price to pay to ensure that you know your 17 by 22 print done on a paper that costs five or six dollars a sheet is going to come out perfect you need a bigger box yeah use one of those boxes use a box the same size as the paper you're printing on that will provide perfect support it will how to fix this problem at the engineering side make a tray that is adjustable yeah you can sit it down for multiple sheets but you can also move it and lift it up and insert it again it's easy to do just do a simple latch type mechanism and it doesn't have to be like perfectly right next to where the you know the print excess a couple of thicknesses down it's enough as long as you have you know an eighth of an inch drop is not going to cause problems it's a three quarter to one inch drop that will cause problems so anyway that's it that's my rant for the saturday afternoon it's i guess it's still afternoon live stream let me go to the chat and see what's cooking here again tonight we're going to ask questions please do that folks ask whatever you wish i'm here to answer i'm going to go through some of our regular sources here and see if we have anything interesting to add and try to answer either through the comment section or the facebook group or dp review i'm also going to show you the other really, really excellent forum, the uh, Printer Knowledge Forum, and that's a really good one as well. It's mostly kind of um, in the UK, so it's going to favor that region of the world. Okay, so where did we leave off? Let's see here. We're talking about the hot temperatures in some of these places, yeah um we're hoping for good weather this coming week we have several good activities planned from uh you know for nathan to be able to he's a very hyper boy so you got to keep that boy super busy all the time 
The only thing that will stop him dead on his tracks and have him just glued is when I play a good movie. And he cannot even hear anything that's happening near him. So, uh, But anything else, yeah, he is just short of attention span, like many kids nowadays seem to be. So was his dad, by the way. So he had problems in school. Anyhow, <laughs> that's enough of the personal stuff. Uh, let's see. Bill Sturk, hello from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That's where my wife is from. Bill Sturk and my friend Joan Jett, nice in the low 70s in Wisconsin today. Great, awesome. Um, Danny Ramos. And by the way, Bill, I think you're a first time visitor. Nice to have you here. And the other person as well, um, Joan Jett. Nice to have you here as well. Danny Ramos, hello. And you didn't say where you were from, Danny. So uh, please let us know that as well. Paul Fleer from Streamwood, Illinois. Andrew Mantovani. Wow, that's a good name. From the Bronx, New York. Tom Volick from Las Vegas. Bruce Ballard, Ballard from Utah, St. George, Utah. George Gab is here from Arlington. Camera is dropping. Oh, he says, Arlington camera is dropping more paper. Got some good deals. I have to take a look at that. Arlington camera, is that the name of the uh, website? Andrew Montavani, the second says, just set up my Pro 100, planning on planning to move to PC's new inks. Start off with the OEM, my friend. And if, if you're already an experienced printer, fine. But if you're not, if you're just beginning, just make sure you master the process before you move on to something that's basically theoretically unknown. Any third-party product should be treated as something unknown. So you need to use something known to learn the process on. And once you master that, then feel free to start using other papers and the inks from Precision Colors, which are really excellent. In this case, you know, it's kind of an exception. You really can go ahead and begin to use those um, because there's hardly, hardly any difference between the OEM rendition and the rendition by the PC sec Signature Edition inks. It's practically the same. Okay. Hear my wife making noise upstairs. Mike Cheney is here. Yay, great. Mike, I received the box today. Thank you so much. I'm going to show that off a bit later on. Um, I've been printing on nothing but Q image lately. A weird situation is taking place with the Lightroom print module. And it started to happen when I began to print multiples, 8 by 10s of the cast photo of the kids in the drama club at our local school that my wife retired from. I was getting great results and then a demarcation line and the color shifted. And I thought, whoa, one of my cartridges is not flowing correctly. That's got to be it. I checked and also checked perfect. I print the same thing again. The whole thing would be, say, yellowish. Okay, okay, that's weird. Run a, run a clean cycle. Also check it's still perfect. And this time it would print perfect. And I, I would send a job. This is a case where I would print multiples. I would send a job. And the first four out of ten would be perfect. And then the fifth and sixth would have perfect. And all of a sudden, I mean, literally just shift in color. So something in the application was causing that. And so I switch over to, you know, QImage did the same thing. Basically, I just used the export tool to QImage and printed the final, you know, 30-something prints, and they were all perfect. So it is something within Lightroom doing so, and I have no clue what it is. And I really am almost afraid to reinstall it because, um, who knows, I may do more harm than good, but I might end up having to do that anyway. It's a weird, weird situation. So I've been printing on nothing but Q image because that is, I mean, spot on every single time.
All right, let's see what else we got here. Anthony, uh, Andrew Mantovani, Mantovani the second. I'm a new subscriber. Great channel. Learned a lot from your videos. Thank you. Okay, speaking of subscribers, you may know or you may not know, we cracked the 24,000 wall. We went right through it. Okay. It was slowly getting there. All of a sudden, we gained like 50 subscribers and cracked right through it a couple of days ago. And also, we hit more than 6 million views, total views, which is really great for a channel such as this that doesn't gain you know, thousands and thousands of views, unlike those other channels that my wife and I like to watch, those funny channels. They get a huge, huge uh, number of views per day on a particular video. But anyway, that's really fantastic. And so the only thing that was kind of bothersome is that I checked part of the analytics that displays and tells you the percentage or, or the so-called ratio between total views. And then it tells you, well, your views for today were from 75% non-subscribers and only 25% were from subscribers. So 75 views or viewers out of 100 are viewing and yet not subscribing. So we got to do something to solve that problem. What do we have to do to help the channel? And I'm not doing this because, oh, I want to be the top. No, I want to do this to increase the viewership and increase the probability of people coming back. Now, it may be that just does they just don't want to subscribe people just don't want to subscribe it may also be that i believe in order for you to subscribe correct me if i'm wrong you have to be logged onto a youtube account to be able to do that maybe that's the case i am not entirely sure um but anyway um imagine if say we get a thousand views and we get a thousand new subscribers you know, and, and, and 750 of those views came from 750 people who are not subscribed. That's what I'm getting at. So I'm glad that they're providing these numbers for us, um, channel owners, to be able to analyze what's happening behind the scenes concerning the growth and the advancement of your channel, because that's what we want to do. We want to get larger and larger so that we can reach more people. And help more people because this that's what this this is a help channel this is not a channel for personal gain it is to help people with their photo printing problems basically to spread the word to provide information news events whatever the case comes up having to do and pertaining to photo printing and also a little bit later on we'll talk about drones i'll show you my newest bebop one it is a blue one. You can get these now dirt cheap, by the way. And my friend Mike Cheney has provided me with, again, another set of legs for my Bebop one because the ones that he gave me before graciously printed out for me couldn't withstand um, a lot of lateral pressure. I hit, remember my video where I smacked into a bush? Yeah, I lost my orientation in my head. And I backed into a bush instead of moving away from the bush. And it snapped two of the legs because the the type of material that they were made from was a little bit more brittle. It was nice and stiff and strong, but more brittle and couldn't just stand the lateral forces. It broke. I had to then remove the other two, of course. And so this time he used a different material. And I forget what he told me. That's a little bit more flexible and able to maybe take some stress and lateral uh, bending if you will i'm going to try not to crash anymore that wasn't really a true crash per se just a a a um a, an inability of the brain to send the correct information to the controller and of course there was an obstacle in the way it happens to the best of us somebody said to me that if you're not crashing you're not flying enough i don't agree with that I don't agree with that. But anyway, that's what people, that's a good excuse, I guess you can say. Okay. Andrew Mantovani says, 
You set up the Pro 100, so we read that already. Planning to move to PCs, new wings. Prior readers seem to suggest topping off all but the yellow cartridges. Recent videos suggest flushing old cars. No, don't do the flushing yourself. Buy a flush set of cars. I don't recommend that you flush the cards unless you really want to. Original set of OEM inks. Put them in there. Begin to print. Certify your printer. Print that Print that, that standard image. Get it from my Facebook group, among many others. Okay, certify the printer can produce a perfect result from that image. Calibrate your monitor. Make sure that the monitor, monitor displays that image just like the printer spat it out. Okay, you're there. That's it. You are done, basically. Now you're ready to print. Now, if you want to switch over to another ink set, what if these inks were not so perfectly matched where you would literally see a transitional change in performance such as not really the case okay these inks are good so yeah you could conceivably just top off your oem your one set of oem but why would you do that oem is king oem is superior in every way shape and form to any other third-party ink even these so take out the partially used oem cartridges Put those orange clips back on them with a rubber band and store them. Okay, tape the vent if you wish and store them. You may need them in the future. You may run into a problem with your second set of cartridges. And I suggest you just buy a second set of cartridges. I have a link on my description. Read my descriptions. It's all there. Okay, I don't just do that to fill up space. It's all there for you guys to see. Go to that link to eBay, buy yourself the best $60 you will ever spend. They will come with plugs. They will come already pre-modified, expertly flushed. The guy goes through more pains than I would ever consider to flush those cartridges correctly. Okay, And also the very good snap-on clips. Fill those up with your Precision Color Signature Edition inks. And then when you're really ready, when you're ready to switch over, you have now mastered, you can print blindfolded on Canon paper. Now it's time for you to switch. Don't do it. Don't do it prematurely. You're still not quite sure what you're doing. Don't buy a $2,000 drone if you can barely fly your $100 one. Okay? Don't jump to that level. It's just silly. Don't do it. So make sure you feel comfortable with printing and you're able to just basically, it just comes as second nature, setting up the driver correctly. Just print with the driver at first. You will get perfect results. I'm telling you, all of this stuff I did with just the driver, okay? My, my comparison of OEM versus Precision Color Signature Edition inks on Pro Luster paper we're done on the Pro 100, simply using the driver. No custom profiling, okay? No letting Photoshop or Lightroom or Q image control color. Simply the driver. If I can get those perfect results just with the driver, so can you. I'm not that bright, okay? Don't forget that. Don't think that I'm some kind of genius. I'm not. Just a regular dude who has managed to figure out how to do this the easy way. Okay, and I'm telling you exactly how to do it. Certify your printer, get your monitor calibrated to match the output of that print. That's it, you're done. Now you can load your images. When you edit them, now you know, okay, the edits that I applied actually make sense because I'm actually viewing my image and it's being displayed to me correctly. So whatever I add, it is going to be reflected in print. Okay, if the monitor is off in any direction, okay, then what you add or subtract simply is not going to matter because if you darken a, an image because it looks too bright, but your monitor is too bright to begin with, then guess what you're sending to your printer? You're sending it a dark print. Oh, no, I'm not. A dark image, I mean. Oh, no, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. Simple. If it's off color, non-neutral, and it's because your monitor is not neutral, 
So you're subconsciously adjusting it to make it look neutral to your eyeballs. Then you're sending, it, you're sending what you think is a neutral print, but it is not to your printer. And the printer is just saying, thank you. Thank you for the, uh, you know, th thank you for sending me another job. Here you go. I hope you like your results. The results are perfect, actually, when you think about it, because they reflect what you send it. Simple as that. Yes, it is that simple. Okay. I hope you don't think I'm BSing you. I'm not. It's really that simple. So, yeah, go ahead. Don't try your own. Okay. Don't try your own. Buy a set of pre modified cartridges. Really, I'm telling you, it is the best 60 bucks you will ever spend. And just load those cartridges up with the Precision Colors inks or whoever's, whatever you choose to use, and install them on your printer. One cleaning cycle, one nozzle check. If you want to do a head alignment, go ahead and do that as well. And now you're ready. Print a standard image, okay? After you certify that the 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 uh, so-called um, nozzle check is perfect, okay, so you need to do that. Then go ahead and do the head alignment because you have to have a perfect nozzle check to perform a proper head alignment. Use the auto setting, okay? And once that is all done, you're ready to now print with those new inks. Hopefully they will match OEM. Hopefully you will not have to have the need for a custom profile. And that's what happens with most other ink sets out there. You will need an adjustment and a custom profile will provide you that. It will sort of bring you back home to a so-called neutral result all right kingsbury crafts says i'm here but i can't stay i'll try to watch later good information all right well i'm glad you at least dropped by and said hello nice to have you here michael fate from california what part i grew up in southern cal jts golf hello jose from southern california and Gerald, Gerard, Gerard, I can't read anything. Gerard Bruno Lamarck had a message, but he retracted it. And Danny Ramos is saying hello to Mike Cheney. Rich Grosso um, dropped a $2 super chat on the channel here. YouTube Premium gave me a free super chat. Enjoy. Thank you so much. Glad you used it on this particular uh, evening. Mike Cheney says, hello, Danny Ramos, Amos Canzoni. I love to experiment with the Pro 100 printing on some matte paper, Red River. Heard the uncoated papers need to be brushed to remove fibers. Actually, those papers are coated. Don't, don't get confused. Jose, would you elaborate on that briefly? Sure. Um, all of the Burrita type papers is not because they're uncoated. It's the type of coating. When you have something like this that has a shiny coating on it you're not going to have any problems with with fibers that are loose when you will have problems is when you have a paper that is basically a non-resin coated paper with a fine art type burrito coating those coatings are extremely fragile okay i don't even know why they bother it's really Often than not, you will go through through two or three sheets to arrive at a perfect result. Printers are mechanical. They use mechanical um, paper advance. There are there are components of the printer contacting that paper at all at all times through its trip from front to back, and so. The more fragile that paper is, the more than likely you will have abrasions, marks, roller marks, uh, pizza wheel marks, and so so forth. Out of the box by itself, and there's a particular um, X Epson fine art paper. Uh, I forget it's something fiber, something fiber. I forget the actual name. Um, I'm really horrible with that. Sorry. Um, you literally have to get a brush like a big brush and just go over the surface before you feed it. 
And the reason also is because of the Burita coating, barium sulfate coating, it tends to leave little flakes hither and yonder. And they're not really attached to the surface, to the coating itself. So they're just kind of floating. You could conceivably print. The ink will be laid over those little loose flakes. And then when it comes out of the printer through your manipulation of the print or whatever the case, those little printed onto flakes will fall off and you will end up with white spots all over the place. So, of course, the recommendation is to brush off or at least use some kind of canned air. Make sure you do that inside the printer as well. If you print a lot with these types of papers, some of the papers in the back, the back is basically untreated, uncoated, and so fibers will slough right off and will dirty up the internal components of your printer. You need to go ahead and vacuum regularly your internal printer, internals of your printer, if you print a lot on those types of papers. RC papers, probably not have to do any of that because they just they're plastic coated nothing will slough off but all of these nice fine art papers do suffer from that so make sure you do that before you print just brush off the surfaces the last thing you want to do is to print over something that's going to fall off later and leave a nice little clear white fiber line where a piece of fiber was it fell off that you print after you printed on it yeah very, very strange, but it'll happen. Gerard Bruno Lamarck says, um, thank you for your outstanding videos. I just discovered about you. While looking for a photography printer, I am in between the Canon Pro 100 and the Pro 10. Which one would you advise, please? Well, it depends. The Pro 10 and the Pro 100 both are great printers. Pro 10 is strictly pigment, 10 colors. 10 color channel, print it. The Pro 100 is 8 color, 8 color channel, print it. The Pro 100, if you live in the United States, I didn't, you, you didn't tell me where you were form, from. I, maybe you did earlier, but if you're in the USA, you can buy the Pro 100 with a humongous rebate. Basically, you will pay something around the neighborhood of about 350 Right off the bat, you will have to pay $350. Then you get a free box of paper that's worth $50. So that's $300. And a $200 to $250 rebate that you have to send in the, the so-called um, code, the barcode of the box. Fill out a form that you download from the seller. And then send that to them. And they will provide you with a... Uh, send that to Canon, I believe. And they will send you a Visa card with you know $250 or $200 in it so you will pay a net of 100 to as low as $50 for the printer the Pro 10 there's not really that great a deal the Pro 10 sells for about $500 $600 retail that's retail price uh, so you know you can find some rebate offers on them uh, the best ones that I've ever seen is right around Christmas time there's a couple of shops that sell them and you end up paying something like $99 net and then plus shipping, $69 to ship to your uh, part of the United States. It only happens here in good old USA. Um, <clears throat> which one is better? Well, it depends what kind of media you're printing on. If you're going to be printing on something with a shine, such as this fine paper right here, or just the lowly Pro Luster, Pro 100, baby. Pro 100 will kick butt because it is a dye base printer and it produces fantastic results it also has two gray inks which allows you to print two black and white type monochrome prints without any kind of linearity problems in other words you will have nice neutral throughout the whole range neutrality throughout the whole range from black all the way to white no change in tonality pro 10 will do the same thing pro 10 uses chroma optimizer to help it along with the you know the lustrous papers like glossy luster semi-gloss that sort of thing burrito 
it uses that clear coating to kind of alleviate or diminish the effect of pigment inks, which cause sometimes bronzing and will also cause some gloss differential problems. And that basically means that, for instance, if you have a border, if you have a border, that means no ink is applied. Well, when you use a particular setting on that Pro 10, meaning auto, automatic application of Chroma Optimizer, it will only apply where there's ink laid on the paper. So areas that have no ink receive zero Chroma Optimizer. That means those areas will look duller because the Chroma Optimizer enhances the gloss of the actual paper surface, okay? You will get gloss differential, and you will see that at certain angles. If you apply it full, it will be applied through the whole surface regardless of whether an area received ink or not. So you'll get a nice even result. Well, with a dye ink printer, if you print on glossy, luster, satin, whatever, semi-gloss, burrita, it doesn't matter. Dye inks have no gloss differential. Okay, so that might be something to look into if you plan to only use papers with a sheen, a certain amount of shine. If you're going to be using fine art papers that are different types of surfaces and you need matte black ink because matte black ink is denser, then you need to use the Pro 10. That applies to matte media. Now, there's a caveat with that. The Pro 10 will only use photo black ink, which doesn't provide the density that you really need on your matte media. Oh, but there's a matte paper choice. Well, no, that will not work. I don't even know why that's there. In order to trigger the use of matte black ink, you have to use the fine art setting on your menu dropdown, on your paper dropdown menu, in other words. And that immediately tells you, whoa, 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 you need to print through the manual feeder. Okay. And it forces you to um, accept a 30 millimeter, millimeter border, front and back, leading edges. At that point, you might as well you know, set up your layout to also have a uh, side, you know, 30 millimeter border. That's a huge border. That's more than one inch. That would be horrible on a letter size print, you see. So that's a big disadvantage, big disadvantage with that. If you use QImage, there's a tool within QImage that would allow you to dismiss that and not accept that border in position. Another reason to buy QImage, okay? It has that ability. So, if we're just gonna print, even on matte paper, what am I saying? Hang on a second. Pro 100, Precision Colors Inks. Matte paper, this is matte paper, folks. Not a bit of shine on it. Look at those blacks. Look at that, that contrast. I don't know whether OEM produces that because I haven't gone back to check. Probably. Probably. Mm. Now this is truly delicious. I may have to take a bathroom break if I keep drinking this much. But my throat is so dry right now. Anyway, so there you go. That is uh, what I would look into. It depends on what kind of uh, papers you're going to be mostly printing on. If they're papers that perform well with dye inks, and now, as we know, the Pro 100 prints quite well on matte paper as well. Um, let me see. This is with the ICM profile, so this is not with a custom profile. So that doesn't seem to have any kind of a effect whatsoever on being able to print nice, dense blacks on the Pro 100. So... Again, but that's with Precision Color Signature Edition inks. I don't know about the OEM black ink performance. At least not on matte paper, because I didn't do that. I forgot to do that. I was too enamored with the uh, luster paper when I was testing it against OEM inks. So I wanted to quickly get that done. So that's why I didn't go back and also test it with matte. Paul Fleer, I'm looking into buying a new monitor for photo editing. What size and brand do you recommend? I don't know about the brand, 
Bank Q seems to be good. I'm using my regular generic HP model that came with my original computer years and years ago. It's a 24 inch. 24 inch is not huge by today's standard. Um, a lot of people are using 32 inch monitors and bigger even or dual monitors for that matter. Um, the only thing I like about this monitor is that it calibrates beautifully. And this originally sold for about five bills. So it's not a cheap monitor back then. And I mean, today I, I am quite sure you can buy equivalent monitors that are just as good or even better for a lot less money. You just need a monitor that has as wide a gamut as possible. So look at those specs. I'm not an expert on monitors. That's why I didn't, you know, delve too much into this little answer here. Robert Gully just uh, dropped two dollars super chat. Thank you so much, Robert. And uh, he says, "Great info as always." Thank you so much, Robert. Paul Fleer, a friend of a friend of mine, suggests either is Azo or Bank. Yeah, Bank Q seems to be um, one of the popular ones out there. And again, another vote for Bank Ben Q. Bank or Ben Q. I don't know how they pronounce that. Jepson Lane from Newport, Rhode Island. Nice to have you here. Thomas R. Which which bad choice would you choose for printing? One. W LAN or 50 meter 49 feet cable. Holy cow. Printer is behind me in the same room. Cannot set it next to me. I don't know. Is that a is that a uh, network cable you're talking about? It shouldn't have a problem. It shouldn't have a problem at all. LAN or or 50 meters worth of cable. I don't know whether you mean. I hope it's not USB. USB. I don't think they recommend more than 12 feet. And again, this is a subject I'm not really that well versed on. Maybe somebody can help. Uh, Thomas, with a proper answer. Bruce Ballard says, how many times will two ounces refill a CLI-42 cart? Well, figure it out this way. How many ml are in a two-ounce cartridge? And when you fill up, I just, lucky for me, I never put this stuff away from last week. When you fill up a cartridge, unless you're filling it from scratch, such as this one, this one is dead, dry, clean, beautiful. Clip the bottom and fill from the top. It will take 13 milliliters of ink to fill it. Okay. After that, you're going to always fill when the cartridge reaches low. That means that this chamber here just touch bottom okay it just like two seconds ago reach bottom you get the low warning if you do it a little bit before that there's no harm done so if you do it like when you see it like literally about to hit low reset it and refill it how much ink can we get in this little chamber that's all the ink you will need because this sponge on this other side will be at a hundred percent saturation level so it's not going to absorb any ink you're just going to simply replenish the empty void here here how much ink about seven eight milliliters of ink okay so do the math the price for a two ounce bottle figure out what two ounces are four ounces are around 120 milliliters of ink ml so figure that out. So 120, it's about 60 ml. So if it takes about seven, then do the math and figure that out. That should give you approximately this, the, the correct number of refills per bottle. And again, keep in mind that you're going to go through your colors at varying amounts. It's not going to be the same, you know, all of them the same being drained. Oh, no, it'll take, it, you know, some, some batches of prints will use up a lot more yellow. Some batches of prints will use up a lot more black, and so and so forth. Magenta, cyan. It just depends on your images, how they will use up each one of your colors. 
I can't believe how bright it still is outside. I'm supplementing my room lighting with some actual window light. This is strictly facing north right now. So I'm just getting uh, the north light, if you will. Whatever color temperature that is. But I hope the uh, the color is okay. All right. Every, every, every time it's a little bit different, I know. All right. Uh, 1066 Internet says... Uh, to Thomas R. It depends on the quality of the cable and what is in the way between the wireless. So I guess he means wireless. Now, if you're like within your home and you don't have a lot of obstacles between you so that you can send a good wireless signal to your printer, it should work. The problem most of the time lies with like a print stopping midway or three quarters of the way i can't explain in technical terms what's happened there but i hear that all the time when you print via wireless or wi-fi or whatever i have all of my printers they're all next door so it's no more than maybe at the most if you foot after one foot after the other maybe maximum 10 to 12 feet between any particular printer in my computer so um again no lag and and absolutely no loss of the so-called spooling of all of the data to your printer so i never have a print that prints halfway uh and stops printing and it spits it out you know with a lot of the image missing that's literally what happens uh let's see Danny Ramos says, I watched you live, the live stream last, several weeks ago. I am by your family in Orlando, Oviedo. Yes, yes, I remember you. I remember you now. All right. Glad to have you again, my friend. Kyle Johnson, when you said a refiller can use one syringe for refilling, what advice do you give to drying out the syringe or long blunt needle? Well, what I do... And this is kind of a, do I have one here? I have a small syringe here with me. Assume there's a needle attached. So I just got done refilling my yellow cartridge. I go to the sink, remove the needle, rinse it under the tap. Rinse this well. Attach the needle. Fill it with water. Give it a couple of pumps. Take it out of the uh, sink. Now it's devoid of water. I give it a couple of air pumps like that. You will see a little cloud of droplets come out. Just get rid of as much as you can. Really, that's enough. Really, you don't have to go through nine different syringes. You could if you if you have the resources. I don't, so I'll use the same syringe. I'll go back and reload my next load and, and just continue doing it. Actually, what I do is not use a needle at all. Check that out. This was made for me via 3D printing. It is a, 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 a little round case that accepts the squeezy bottles. This is what I use. This is what I use. I take an alcohol pad. I clean out my needle. The same alcohol pad or another one. And I clean out the fill hole. Boom. Flip upside down. Fill. That's it. I get done. Excuse me. Put it back in my little container. I just got some blue ink on me. Again, it holds all eight colors. So this is designated for the Pro 100. And again, this is what I use. Unfortunately, guess what these inks are? It's my old inks. Not the, not the new ones. So I have to... I hate to say it, but I'm going to probably dump these. Okay. I'll put them in a bottle with some bleach and then dispose of it. But then I'm going to have to clean those bottles really, really well, dry them really, really well, and then go ahead and load them with the new load of inks that I received from PC. And from now on, from that point on, I'll be using those new inks. 
Right now I'm loading with a syringe my Pro 100 cartridges. Uh, Cal Johnson says, okay, no, Thomas R. Wireless should be, would be two meters, 6.5 feet cable. I not bought yet would need to lead in a blanket. What? <laughs> okay, that's a little weird. I'm not going to read those um, because I really, I think there's a lot of uh, typing errors here, maybe, possibly. No, 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 um, nothing mean meant by that. Uh, wireless should be two meters. Okay, then, uh, need to lead it at the blanket, not to lead it across the room. That's why 50 meters, 49.2 feet. Okay, whatever. Uh, and then some people suggest USB cable um, as opposed to network cable. I don't know exactly what. But anyway, uh, let's see. We'll go ahead and, and jump over to uh, something of a different subject. Amos Kansoni says, I didn't subscribe until I had made the decision to buy my first photo quality printer. Thus, I was fence sitting and watching many of your videos first. I guess most subscribers have printers uh yeah but i mean you know like i don't have a 3d printer i cannot make things like this at least not yet okay that's that may be coming but um that doesn't keep me from not subscribing to a channel i mean it's just as easy to unsubscribe to a channel when you kind of lose interest in the subject but at the point at least in the beginning when i'm trying to learn something and I am binging on these videos. I will go ahead and subscribe just to make sure that I catch anything new that's coming. See, I view all of my YouTubes on my TV. So I'm able to just use, I use a Roku uh, device. And so I can just go to my subscribers tab and everything that they have uploaded new shows up on that one page. So I can just go through all my subs and see what they have new i don't have to click that bell notification icon at all that only that only applies for people on phones tablets and computers but for people who watch youtube on on a tv that doesn't really apply but i tend to subscribe with someone that i if i if i watch a couple of videos and you interest me i'll subscribe to you i will I could always unsubscribe if you know if if I find out that yeah okay that's not my cup of tea I'll go ahead and uh, switch over to some other subject right Michael Fate just set up this Pro 1000 oh boy based on everything you have said in your videos it looks like I can let the printer manage the color from Photoshop and Lightroom as long as I am using Canon papers is that correct absolutely yes as long as you're using Canon papers, in fact, in fact, and specific to the Pro 1000, and, and don't get confused by this. Don't confuse color management printing through an ICC profile, whether you use the driver or not. Remember, when you set your color intensity manual adjustment to ICM on matching, tab open that up and choose ICM and if you're printing on matte or pro luster or semi-gloss or glossy whatever as long as you're telling the driver to use ICM matching it will load that same profile the matching profile for Canon papers so not only are you printing through the Canon paper profile through the driver, which means you don't have to worry about Photoshop managing color or Lightroom. But here's the best deal. Here's the best part of this. If you're going to concentrate on Pro Luster, for instance, that's just what you're going to cut your teeth in. Okay. You're going to learn, you're going to master the process just using Pro Luster. And that's what I suggest you do. Just one paper, just master that. 
So you can print blindfolded. I know if I just press this button, do this and that, I'm going to get a perfect match. Okay, because I have done all my other preliminary setup. My monitor matches my output of that standard image. Again, repeat over and over and over. That's how it goes. So, guess what you can do with the Pro 1000? Because the Pro 1000 out of the box is not perfect, I hate to tell you. But neither is any other printer. It's not perfect. It's within a certain... Uh, tolerance level okay plus or minus somewhere around the middle is perfection how many printers go through the QA or QC and are, are rendered perfect nobody really knows you know why because they don't really test the printers they may test a few random units but in order to test a Pro 1000 they would have to literally fill it with ink and then they would have to empty it of such ink before they mail it to you in a, in a sealed box. So they're not going to test it. You're the tester. You're the calibrator. The Pro 1000 has a built-in densitometer. Okay? It is built in. You access it through the LCD screen. Okay? And if Pro Luster is what you're going to be using, and they gave you that free box, you might as well start to master that paper. Cut yourself some, you know, letter size or buy a box of letter, letter size paper. Load a few sheets. Here's what you do from the get go. You install your printer. You successfully installed the printhead. You charge the whole system. You did a nozzle check. Okay. Do the nozzle check with a good paper, not the cheap, you know, copy paper. The reason you want to do this is because that luster paper has very, very low dot gain or ink wicking, okay? If you drop a micro, drop, micro dot of ink on a piece of copy paper and that micro dot has a micron diameter, it will end up being a two micron diameter after it spreads. So how could you possibly see that a nozzle is missing on your nozzle check? You just can't. It all blends together and you think everything is cool. No. Print it on a paper that has minimal dot gain. That way you take your little loop, which you should have, a 10x loop. Print your nozzle check on that particular type of paper and have a look at it. Have a look at it. And you can determine what's missing or what's not missing. Because you don't want to have any kind of blending of your results. When you do your, your printhead alignment then, after verifying that your nozzles are 100% firing, also use a good luster paper, okay? Again, to minimize dot gain, minimize the blending, because the head alignment is gonna look at certain things. It's gonna look at little gaps. You don't want to fill in what would have been a gap. Then it cannot be read. Okay, it cannot be read by the printer. The printer has internal sensors that do this for you. So use luster paper for these two tests. Okay. Once you have done your head alignment, that means that you will not have banding between each lateral pass. Okay. You will not have overlapping and you will not have a gap begin to develop between this way and that way because the paper advances after each pass advance pass advance pass advance that has to be synchronized exactly to within one nozzle distance okay so that everything matches perfectly pass after pass the higher your quality the more overlapping takes place okay now once you do that there's one third thing you can do this is the most important thing, and many people don't even know it's there. Calibrate your printer. Wait a minute, what? You can calibrate your printer? Yes, you can calibrate a Pro 1000, 2000, 4000, 6000, and also the IPF 6400 series. They have these built-in densitometers. And so what you do is you're going to load up a, a known source, a known paper. Known to what? Known to the printer. Canon Pro Luster or semi gloss, whatever. As long as it's a Canon paper, whatever you're going to be using down the road. You're not going to create a profile. That's not what we're doing here. 
you already have a profile. It's loaded in your hard drive. And if you use matching ICM, the driver is going to automatically use it. As long as you always choose ProLuster as their paper choice. Get it? It's all connected. What are we doing with this calibration? You are taking that printer. This is the this is the area of um what's the term again? I just said it earlier. Tolerance. Okay. You want it to be right in the middle, smack dab in the middle. This is leading toward uh, too low, too high, just perfect. Okay. So perfect, let's just say it's in the middle. But your printer is on the too high side, whatever that means. It's not quite perfect. Calibrating it will bring it to perfection. Imagine this. Three fictitious Pro 1000s. One in California, one in Chicago, and one here in my house. Okay. Mine is maxed out on the plus on the right side. Anything anything left or right of middle is bad, okay? But not so bad that you can actually tell, but still bad. Minus is bad, plus is bad, neutral is good. Now, the one in Chicago is neutral. Out of the box, it is perfect. It's like buying a car that was so perfectly fitted at the factory that it is, by all means, the factory specifications car. That car is perfect. Whereas a car made in LA is a little bit loose on the bearings and all the joints and all the moving parts. There's a little bit of slop. The car on the right, everything is a little too tight. Too tight. It just doesn't doesn't turn, you know, and rub as easily as the one in the middle does. Okay. So those are our three printers. By doing this calibration, and what does it do? Well, the printer takes the paper, and you do this strictly through your LCD screen. There's no need to even use the driver. In fact, you may not have even loaded the driver on your computer yet. This is all done on the LCD screen of your printer. So, when you print that calibration chart, and again, it's similar to color patches done for profiling, but this is not profiling. This is setting up known values, the printer prints them, and then it reads them. And then it says, oh, you know what? These should have been rendered just a little this way. And this one should have been rendered just a little this way. Oh, and this one is perfectly rendered. We're not going to make any change with that particular color patch. It goes through all of these colors, and it creates a condition. I'm not going to call it a profile, a situation that it then saves to the computer's internal memory okay the computer not the, the printer's computer the printer's uh internal memory they have a motherboard and i think it goes in the epron chip i'm not sure i'm not going to quote on that but it saves that information and that then the one in chicago remember was perfect no change takes place because it was perfect the one in my home is brought to the condition of the one in chicago okay the one in LA is brought into the condition of the one in Chicago. So now all three printers are matching. So we all decide to get together in Chicago. So I travel to Chicago with my big ass printer. I keep it level all the way across the trip so that I don't lose any ink. That's another subject. You know what I'm talking about. The one in LA as well. When we get to Chicago, all of a sudden we receive a huge print job. We need to create a thousand prints and we're going to utilize all three printers, one computer. Guess what? I can print 333 and a third prints on my computer, on my printer. The Chicago guy can print the same number on his printer and the California LA guy can print the same number on his printer. They will all be identical. They would not be identical otherwise had they not been calibrated. That's all you're doing. You're bringing the Pro 1000 to a state that is considered factory specs, okay, where it wasn't before. Out of the box, it just wasn't, unless you got lucky. And again, if you got lucky, go buy a lotto ticket. You may have won. So that is something that 
really, they don't really explain it that well, but it's something that you can do. You can sort of do that as well, excuse me, with the Pro 1 and the Pro 10, utilizing the Canon color management tool. But then you have to use one of these. You have to have one of these. Because those printers do not have internal densitometers. You have to have one of these X-ray products to be able to perform that internal calibration. All it'll do is just bring that Pro 10, that Pro 1 to a guaranteed so-called factory specifications level. Where it may not have been. So what does that open up? Well, it opens up all kinds of different uh, opportunities, right? I can I can create a single profile and give it to the guy in LA, the guy in Chicago. Now that our three printers are identical, they both output the same quality uh, output. I can share the same profile, whereas before calibration, each of us would have to create our own profile if you really, really want to get picky about it. Okay. I usually share profiles that I create. Those are more generic. So yeah, I made it on the Pro 100 with Precision Colors Signature Edition ink on this paper. And I give it away in my Facebook group. That's assuming that you are also the owner of Pro 100 using Precision Color Signature Edition and that very same paper, you should get close to similar results as mine. Not exactly, because mine may be calibrated and yours may not be but you'll still get pretty much as close as you can possibly get. There'll be a slight deviation that no one's going to really see, but only instruments can read. So that's the whole thing about calibration, is just to bring, bring your printer to a standard. For the owner of the Pro 1000 that just set it up, I hope that does not make your head explode. It's really not as bad. That's what I went through explaining it because I got a motor mouth and I, I talk too much. And that's just the way I am. It's really a lot simpler than that. You just perform those actions and when you are done, you basically are done. You're ready to begin to print. All right, they're still talking about network cords and things like that. You guys go ahead and read these comments here at your leisure. Remember when you guys watch this, if you do watch it at a later time, uh, you will not be able to interact with the chat, but the chat is actually made visible. Even when this becomes a, uh, a so-called video, it'll actually flow uh, chronologically with the video as the video uh, begins to play. So right now we've been on for almost two hours. We've got about another hour to go. Our good friend is going to come to visit us. We're going to go watch a movie upstairs. So I don't want to stay too late tonight. But it's a few more subjects I want to possibly cover up. Especially if we start looking at some of these uh, comments here. There may be some things that we need to address here for everyone. I haven't spoken with Mike from Precision Girls for quite a while. Um... Since the last time we spoke, I think he was simply telling me that after the development of the Signature Edition for the Pro 100 inks, uh, he's going to take it easy. No more ink developments for the time being, at least not for the rest of the year. I don't know what else he's going to address. I think he was going to do a, a Signature Edition for the P800, for which there is not one. Uh, there's some improvements to be done on that ink set as well. And again... Folks, you know, you know you know the situation with the PA hundred. There's really no no um, convenient way to use refillable cartridges or third party products. It just isn't. Uh, if you're brave enough to try that so called chipless firmware, by all means do so. Uh, if you've already invested on a decoder board, many many of you know about them, but very few of you probably have done it. I only have one because I was given one. As a promotional item and I did some videos to to show it off and I also did some videos to show off the fact that the first two did not work so you know they still were gracious enough to provide me with a final copy of it that worked and is still working on my computer I mean on my printer my P100 
But really, realistically, really, there's no other way except to use the chipless firmware, 60 something dollars. And you better install it correctly. You better follow the uh, steps. I have not seen yet an actual demonstration of the installation on a PA-100. It's always some other printer model. So you got to take it with a grain of salt. But it's there to be sold by the people at the WIC uh, tool, WIC tool. And again, if I had an extra PA-100 that I could just, you know, use as a guinea pig, I would certainly use it. But I don't want to take a chance with my only PA-100 that I have here. And so far, it's working perfectly with the refillable cartridges acting as just ink receptacle receptacles. It doesn't use the chips any longer because it's using the chips embedded within the decoder board. All of that is bypassed. The decoder board now controls all chip recognition and resetting to full. Pain in the neck, but, you know, it's, it's all we have to go by. And so I don't know why he wants to do a... Uh, a uh, signature edition ink set for it. Hey, if he wants to, he's more than uh, welcome to do so. We have, let's see, DB, DBEI Design, Dan, I don't know how to pronounce that first set of four letters, Dan from Santa Cruz. I assume that's California. Michael Fate, Mission Viejo, California. Michael Fate, the test print file that has an embedded profile, Profoto RGB. Yes, it is. Should I change that to Adobe? No, just leave it. No, here's here's what happens. Just open it. Open it and print it. Um, set it so that it does not alter. In other words, set your color preferences to give you a warning. Okay, when you try to open it. Okay. You can do that in Photoshop. Set it so that it gives you a warning, which will tell you that you want to change the working color space to the working color space, in other words, of the image, to the working color space of Photoshop. Say no, okay? Or set Photoshop to ProPhoto RGB, okay, if you want to. But it is not to be changed, okay? And you could do that in the, in the um, color management section of Photoshop. File color preferences, sorry. And there, then, then in there, go to one of the tabs which will handle that that choice, that setting. And I have it set so that it always warns me when I open up a file that doesn't match the working color space, which is Adobe RGB uh, 1998. 1066 Internet. Yes, don't change it. Print as is. InDesign says Pro Photo RGB will give you a wider color gamut. Sure, uh, that's what you want to do because you're testing the printer's ability. The printer will never be able to cover Pro Photo RGB gamut. Of course not. It's going to fall short. So you want to give it more than the printer can handle. Don't don't change it to sRGB, okay? Because your printer, depending on what printer, you might be able to print beyond sRGB. Okay, so always feed it more than it can handle. So when you lose some, you know that you'd use the maximum gamma the printer could produce out of that gigantic Pro Photo RGB gamma. Ten sixty six says Jose Rodriguez, when you are getting, when are you getting the Pro your test Pro one hundred sys? Uh, I looked into it. I just haven't ordered it yet. I did get a little bit of money coming in from uh, in my PayPal, so I may go ahead and order it this week. And um, maybe I'll just go ahead and forego this swap and just fill fill the uh, sys with those inks. The problem is, um, no, there'll be no problem. They don't sell it pre pre filled with inks. I'm thinking of something else. Something else they used to sell on, on uh, eBay. Richard Lambert says, Hi, Jose. We are catching walleyes in northern Minnesota. Nice. I would enjoy being fishing right now, too. Eli Jose says, Eli Jose, this week I spurged and got a Sony A7R. 
III, whatever that is, full 42 megapixel full frame camera for printing. Can the Pro 100 print at a higher DPI than 300 to get more detail in your prints? Ah, uh, you could set it to uh, 600. Yeah. Um, the thing is, it's automatically. If you just use the higher printer's quality, that's it. You're limited by the printing resolution of your printer anyway. The native resolution or minimum standard native resolution is 300. When you use high, it uses 600 by whatever. It could be a multiple of uh, four. So it'll be like 600 by 2400. Okay, always multiples of 300. So would you see the difference? Mm, not really, not really. The big advantage comes in your ability to crop into your image when you're using a high megapixel sensor. The only catch is you can have a million megapixels in your sensor, but is your glass able to produce the level of detail that a million megapixel sensor you know, would be able to take advantage of? Probably not. There are theoretical limits to optical resolution. They're limited literally by the wavelength width of a particular color. So you could increase, 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 and finally you hit a wall. You have exceeded or almost about to match the size of the wavelength of a, of a blue ray of light, okay, or red or yellow or green. So having a high megapixel, I have a 12 megapixel camera that performs a 24 megapixel camera. Okay, in the game, the same size 13 by 19 prints. The 12 megapixel camera produces a better result. Why? The sensor is better. So more, more sensor units, okay, RGB sensing units, pixel catching units, doesn't necessarily mean better quality. But in this particular case, yeah, that's a damn good camera, I have to admit. But you better have glass to match, okay? Otherwise, you know, if the glass can only capture in barely enough detail for a 12 megapixel camera, then going to a higher megapixel camera simply will not really make a difference at all. It'll just give you the ability to crop into the image itself more, but you better have the details. So you see it's kind of a catch-22, but congratulations, man. That's a great camera. Let's see, I think someone else commented here. Um, Mike Mansfield, hi everyone, joining you from Stockport, UK. Great, I did this specifically for you guys in the UK, but now it's late over there now. So I I, I was hoping you guys joined me at the five o'clock Eastern Standard Time USA, and that would be a little bit earlier than you guys are normally accustomed to jumping in. And I get people at one o'clock AM over there. And so, yeah. That was my idea of having this um, flow a little bit early, earlier. And so far, I think it's working out. We got 41 people. That's awesome. That's really good. Okay. Mark, let's see, Mark Soderberg from Oceanside, California. Okay, that's Southern California. Uh, does the new PCSE yellow suffer from jet gel issue? We don't know. He's going to test that. His his thinking is that no. Okay. But don't put that in the bank yet. Okay. We do not know yet. He's got to run some actual scientific testing. See the condition? Let me finish the question first of all. I noticed PC is still shipping yellow cartridges with kids. Yeah, that's because he doesn't want to take a chance on you guys. Okay. He's a pretty conscientious dude. He doesn't want to take a chance on you guys. Um, other than that, we're going to determine that. And he's I think he's going to sacrifice his printer to determine whether that will happen. And again, just because it doesn't happen doesn't mean it couldn't happen. For me, it took three refills of the yellow cartridge, the OEM yellow cartridge. I did it unbeknownst. I was one of the first ones to report the problem. And then the condition was just right. And it caught me off guard. 
But the first refill, nothing happened. The second refill, nothing happened. The third refill, you think by now, right? By the third refill, it would be late enough. Oh, no. Bingo. It happened. And it was mild enough for me to be able to clear it with Windex dripping in the yellow uh, intake sponge of the printhead. Cleared it out. Popped it back into the printer. Put another yellow cartridge that I had flushed prior to that. And it was fine. So... Yeah, it's very tricky. There's no way to really do a comprehensive, like, scientific test. In other words, does it happen just with the inks touching each other? Or is it water? Okay, what is it? What is causing it? We do not know. He's going to run some tests. Whatever he does, I have no clue what he's going to do. And then he's going to let me know. And then I'll pass it on to you guys. But again, it's you're still... Taking a chance. You're still taking a chance. I will go ahead and just don't worry about it and just use a flushed card. Ten sixty six internet to Eli. Can you go six hundred on the cannon? But I doubt your eyes will see much difference from three hundred. Yeah, remember guys. Dot gain. Even on glossy paper, even on that Pro Luster. Pro Luster has minimal dot gain, but really, the eye cannot really see 300 perfectly spaced dots. Okay. And they're going to be blending, and they're not, it's not just a line. It's a, it's a composite of dots. That's what's called dithering. Some here, some there, some there, some there, like that. It's not a perfect grid like a, like a window screen. No, it's not. It's going to be a smattering of these dots. Who is that? I think it's our friend. Yeah, it's our friend. She's on her way. Anyway, so yeah, so don't worry about that. There's going to be some blending. Uh, 300. Um, I, I go to the higher setting of your Pro 100. Just do that, and that will extract the most quality that printer can produce anyway. There's no way to go any higher. That's it. It's either standard or high, period. You're done. So just do that, and you'll be fine. And enjoy that new camera, my friend. George Gab has to go, but have a great evening, my friend. Good night. Art of Women Photographers here. He has to drag his way away from beautiful women, possibly. Nah, actually, it's quite early over there, 7 a.m. Sunday morning over there. Michael Fate, Jose, you mentioned using the matching icm when printing which with the printer driver to canon paper i'm not familiar with that can you elaborate sure let me show you exactly what i mean i'm going to go ahead and minimize this a minute here we got 42 people on board that's awesome okay let's go ahead and go to the control panel i'm using windows uh, if you guys are not then i cannot help you okay this is only for windows so let's just pick the Pro 100, right click, Printing Preferences, and then we go to this window here. This is your standard main window. You have a borderless printing that we click on and you get this nice big warning here. Print quality may deteriorate or the sheet may be stained at the top and bottom depending on the type of media used. See what I mean? See what I told you? Who reads that? No one does. They just ignore it. Okay, so click on this color slash intensity manual adjustment. We'll click on it. It opens up this new tab. Here's what we're going to do. Click on matching. Now, if I am printing, letting the driver control color, remember? Well, we have to go back to the original. Uh, yeah, here we go. Pro Luster paper. So, by basically clicking on ICM, it will then load automatically the Pro Luster paper profile. Or, see, you have to set on auto. That's, that's important as well. And this should be set on relative colorimetric. If you want to only print in gamut colors correctly, if you have a lot of out of gamut colors, then they recommend perceptual. That's another subject altogether. Keep it on auto. Or if you want to manually load your own profile to match it, you can do, do that as well. 
but auto will do that for you automatically. That is it. Matching ICM in auto and OK. Boom. Apply. And that will be remembered from now on. Every time you print on the Canon Pro 100, it will load up those particular settings for you. If you're going to print with the application control in color and you're going to load up the Pro Luster profile manually, then you would set that to none instead of ICM. That way the driver doesn't interfere. Okay, You want the application to load up that profile and print through it to your, to your printer, your driver. Michael Faith says, Jose, you mentioned... Okay, we already did that. Eli, yes, I got two of the Sony top-of-the-line lenses. They are rated to perform over 100 megapixel sensors. Awesome, awesome. You're all set. What did that cost you, man? Dang. I'm worried about a $140 assist unit. It's good. Congratulations, man. Rick Johnson, hello from the West Coast. All righty. Jim Porth, I received a color brochure from Epson with P800 in for $895 with rebates. Does that mean Epson is soon replacing the P-Series? No, no. Uh, that printer was actually going, I want to I want to say for $999, so yeah, big deal. You know, I would be worried if it was $600 after rebate. No, I there's, there's nothing coming out. There really isn't. Uh, I haven't seen anything in any of the reports on the latest electronic shows or anything like that. And besides, I mean, get ready to accept this, but refilling is going to be a thing of the past. Enjoy what you have now. I always, I always say that, and you know, whatever printers you have now, I'm blessed to have like 13 of them at this point. And they're all refillable except for the P800, but at least now I can refill it with my decoder board, whatever, you know. But take care of your printers, okay? I'm going to give you a, a bit of a, an analogy because it, it, it serves in the same way. Uh, Pro 100 can be bought, like I said, in the USA after rebates for like a net, including paper that you get for free, like 50 bucks. Buy a couple of those. Keep them on the side. Believe me, I guarantee you that the next consumer level semi-pro printer that Canon makes will very likely be locked. Okay, It will be impossible unless somebody comes up with some sort of reversible firmware. And it's very simple for these guys to come up with a way to not even allow that to work. Okay. So keep, in, keep that in mind. Enjoy the printers you have now. Take good care of them. Use them regularly. Lack of use will shorten your printer's lifespan. Period. It's not the opposite. It's not because you use them a lot that they go bad. It's because you don't use them enough. If you leave your car sitting around for year after year after year and you only drive it or idle it once a month, it will go bad. Okay, it will go bad. And so the same thing with a printer. Just use it. Um, in a way, if you really value your Pro 100, again, like I said, buy a couple of them. So far, they're still in production. And so far, they're still offering these rebates. Why not? Right? And now we have these awesome inks that will cost your, your, cost your, your printing to... Cut your printing printing cost to almost nothing, comparably speaking, that is. So, yeah, just remember that whatever comes out, P800 is never going to be unlocked unless you can get that, that so-called um, chipless firmware to work. I'm not going to use it on mine, period. It's, that's not going to be the case at all. Somebody would have to volunteer to test this and then report fully back to us. I had a guy on my Facebook group who sort of did that, but I had to go back and forth and literally hit him on the head with a hammer to, to be able to disclose what it was that he did. And I still didn't get all the details, so whatever, you know. Uh, but the offer is there on the WIC tool. 
uh, I just can't really verify that it will work because nothing else but the con so-called um, decoder board will allow you to use, you know, refillable systems on that printer. That's it. There's nothing really else. You would have to go back and find some older used printers in good condition, refurbish them yourself because you're not going to find parts for them. So again, the the future is looking kind of bleak when it comes to us home printers who also enjoy refilling. That's just the sad, sad truth. And so my Pro 1000, I'm taking care of that baby. Um, I'm so glad that it uses the external or user replaceable um, wasting cartridges because otherwise it would just be crazy. If the internal pads would ever fill up, that's it. Why bother? Let me tell you what happened. Someone contacted me. And I could not help them. They wanted to know about the, uh, what was it? The Pro One. The Pro One has gone out of production for quite a while now. And the harsh reality is that there's no support for it anymore. You can't even take a Pro One to most service centers, even the Canon official service centers. Mine's about 40 miles north of here. And have them replace those internal ink pads. You know why? They can't locate them. They can't find them. They just don't exist anymore. They're gone. I don't know whether I don't know whether they're gone because they all got used up or what. But this dude has got a pro one that he can't use because of that problem. And so I decided, let me look on eBay. You know, you find anything on eBay, right? Maybe even a, even a, a Pro One with no head. That would be cool. A Pro One by itself, no head, no ink. I'll buy it for a couple hundred bucks if I can then use my print head and load up my inks and start from fresh again. Nope. I found one for fifteen hundred dollars. What are you? Are you? What drugs are you on? Come on. You know that's crazy, right? So yeah, that's what's happening. The uh, Pro One is, is 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 a goner. So I'm taking good care of mine. That's what I'm going to say at this point. Um, but yeah, just be aware that the future does not look very good for us home refillers. I just don't have any reason why Epson or Canon would produce printers that would be able to be hacked by the companies that produce these products why would they right why would they um unless they pass some kind of law uh some maybe international law or maybe in america say the supreme court passes some kind of law that says that they are not allowed to block these printers from the use of third-party products they'll do that they'll do that until they are forced not to but I don't see that happening. So anyway, I hate to bring up stuff like that. But, you know, that's that's really what it's looking like right now. Um, so just keep that in mind. Mike Mark Wagner, still learning from the master. Oh, boy. Um, I'm, I'm not even close to being a master. Art of Women Photography says, yes, no shoots today, but catching up with editing images and doing some prints for clients. Stay busy. It is Sunday. Mark Wagner, Jose, I just bought my first serious printer, the Canon Pro 100, and my most recent photo shoot now looks amazing in caps. Awesome. I'm glad that was, you know, that's working out for you. Let's check out the uh, Facebook group. We got about 40 minutes left. I'm going to Go over this real quick and see what we have going on here. Uh, let's see. We have 2699 members of the group. We got to hit that 2700, maybe by tonight. We'll see. Let me refresh the page and maybe we'll have a request. Nope. We're still at 2699. The only thing that I can't 
see is if people leave the group. So I see people joining, but I don't see if they actually leave the group. You know, people are still having problems with Canon Print Studio Pro. Let me show you guys real quick. Let me see if I have that here. Let me open up Photoshop a minute here. Tell you what I use. What I did was, regardless of the printer that you have, I went to the Pro 1000 uh, software section in the driver. For driver support, type in Pro 1000 and download the oh by the way have a look at this you see how it's asking me see i opened up this image here it's a jpeg see how it's asking me it says the document bebop drone blah 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 does not have an embedded rgb profile because it came out of my drone okay so would i like to assign a profile that would be asked if the for example if the image had a different profile. Let's cancel that. Let's open up this JPEG. See that? This JPEG's profile or color space, embedded color space, matches my working color space of Photoshop. Let's go to Edit and Color Settings. Here's where you get to pick that. Okay. It says Convert to Working in RGB. Preserve embedded profiles. So you save it to that all the time. I don't know why that was set to that. So Adobe RGB 1998 is my working color space. That matches pretty much all of the images that I, you know, download and, and view. Now watch what happens. See that? This is the Profoto RGB. So it's saying use the embedded profile instead of the working space. So that's what you guys need to do. When you open that, it has not changed the embedded working space. Okay, so that's what you guys need to do. Let me go back to me. That will ensure that, you know, whatever color space the image was embedded with, it will, it will remain the same. Now, Canon Print Studio Pro is what I really meant to look at. Stupid me. Hang on a second. Let me go back to... See that? My brain is getting old, guys. Let's go to Photoshop again. So we're going to just go ahead and open up something. Just anything. So I want to show you what you guys need to do. So let's just open that up again. And say I want to go ahead and print it with my Canon plugin. So you're going to go automate and locate that. If I even have it installed, I don't think I installed it. It would normally be here. The one that you need to install, excuse my fumbling around tonight, is this one. Let's go ahead and open up a new, a new um, tab. And I'm just going to type in uh, Canon printer driver support USA and make sure that it doesn't lead me to some other some other non-canon support page here we go Canon USA official you got to be careful with that so pro 1000 we're going to type in pro 1000 there it is click on that go here we go so what do we want drivers and downloads so here's what you do click on software we're going to get a specific um printer program here we're going to find the print studio pro version 2.23 that's the one we want and also there's a professional print layout version 1.0 for Windows. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and download both of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we see that. Okay, 
and then the Print Studio Pro version. Download and sure, we like that. Okay, so both of them are downloaded. We'll get out of that page. We'll minimize that. Let's see if this works. So this is the one, the layout, and this is the PSP. So we'll go ahead and load that. People are having troubles with actually linking to your Photoshop. It's telling you that you're using a, a non-supported uh, Photoshop version. Complete. Okay, we'll go ahead and install the layout program. And I'm going to be doing some videos on this in the future. That's it. I think we're done. Let's go ahead and open Photoshop again. Let's see what happens. Let's cross our fingers. See if it actually is living in the Automate tab. File, Automate. And it is not. Okay. So here's what we need to do. We'll close Photoshop. We'll click here and do PSP. Let's see if we can find it. Canon, we'll do Canon. Often what will happen is it will install it in some other location and you just simply have to copy the, um, the so-called uh, plugin into your automated, your automate um, print uh, folder. You see what, see what I'm, you know, having a hard time here right now as well, because this is what people are experiencing. And we don't know what's causing that, whether it is simply the, um, just the driver not, not doing it correctly yeah it's just finding the um, the installer as well so let me see if there's some other option that you can pick here so it's telling you where it's being installed so let's go ahead and click on your hard drive we're going to locate program files Canon and then Print Studio Pro. Let's go ahead and hit that and see what happens. Plugin installer. Let's see what happens now. A version of Adobe Photoshop supported with, is not installed. See, that's what it is telling everybody that it is not installed. So what we need to do is see manually where to install it. Okay, we've got to look it up. And for whatever reason, they have not updated their install program, which is really goofy. So we have to locate where the plugins should be installed in the first place. So we're going to go to Adobe, then Photoshop, and then plugins. No. Presets, it's got to be where the automate um, folder is living. Nope. Hmm. Let me go ahead and locate it manually here. So, again, this is something that you have to kind of manually do. I did a uh, video explaining how to do it uh, on earlier versions of Photoshop. That's not where we want it. Although that may be because, hold on a second, see that? This is the Q Image Automate plugin and it is setting in the correct folder. So we'll go ahead and choose that just for fun. We could always revert. Click and it did not give me an exit. It, not, it did not give me a next option here. So maybe that's not going to work. Sorry, guys. But again, I'm suffering the same problem that a lot of these people have been experiencing. It's really crazy. 
See, if it was a correct one, it would give me a, um, a good, to, good to go. What if we choose Adobe Photoshop 64? And let's see what happens. Maybe that will work. I'm going to start the system later because I don't want to cut you guys off. And it says that it's um, installed successfully. Let's see. There's a ton of people having this problem, folks. That's why I'm taking the time to do this right now. Who knows? Let's open that one up. Let's go to File and Automate. And I still do not see it there. All right, so, you know, that's a problem that exists. Apparently, the installer just does not see the current version of Photoshop. I'm using the very latest because I subscribe to it and it's not seeing it as something that is viable. So that is nuts. And for whatever the reason, um, you know, just like with printer drivers and different operating systems and they don't communicate with each other they're not keeping up with the updates of each of the two main uh, operating systems one driver may produce problems on a mac when you update your mac os uh, you know the same thing could happen with windows 10 you update windows 10 now as the windows 10 is updatable for life pretty much and the driver that you have running maybe not being compatible might introduce some problems here and there. Again, it's crazy. These companies need to continue to update. This PSP plugin is supposed to work with Photoshop regardless of the version. It's nuts. That should not be happening. So anyway, sorry I couldn't make it work for you guys. I know there's a lot of you who are having that problem. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. I don't understand. Maybe if you, if you do a uh, installation with administrative rights, maybe it'll work. Who knows? I will try that at a later on tonight after I bid you guys goodbye. Right now, it's about half hour before we call it a night. Ten sixty six internet says Jose. The P eight hundred block is only applicable to North America and Canada. Yes. The rest of us can use user refillable cartridges, perhaps a caveat before discussing, as most of us are not watching from the U.S. Yes, I apologize for that. Only in the U.S., only in the U.S. And But don't, don't take that to the bank, because I've heard rumors, and again, they're not substantiated, but this may spread to other people parts of the world yeah especially those areas that are just flooded with third-party stuff one of the biggest countries in the world you know who i'm talking about so you know i i just don't know um but again yeah this only applies to the u.s so i apologize for not letting that little bit tidbit out as well jeff thompson consumer protection laws are much more favorable in the UK, which is likely why the P800 is not blocked in Europe. Yeah, again, I don't know why that's happening here, and specifically why just the P800. The new versions of Sure Color printers are all locked. Okay, all of them are locked. There are some experimentation going on with something like the P6000, whatever that is. Um, Inkjet Mall is working on that. But they've been working on that for quite a while now. Um, other than that, that's it. Yeah. I wish we had the uh, consumer uh, protection laws that the UK has. We don't in this country. So we are basically under, you know what, the thumb of the uh, companies. So again, I don't see it changing here unless something radical takes place in the near future or possibly even the far future i don't see it happening maybe i should be a little bit more op optimistic but i i just don't feel it's going to happen i think it's going to get worse <clears throat> 
DBEI design says, check your user directory. Yeah, I will. I will that later on tonight. Mark Wagner, Jose, I have a technical issue. Some of my prints, the reds look great and some they come out brown instead of red. Boy, I, that's that's kind of a blind question. I really don't know what would cause that. A printer should not change in the way it addresses the information that it receives. I I couldn't even begin to guess why that would happen. Assuming that all of the images you're talking about look normal on your monitor, that should not happen. That is that is a weird one. I would have to be sitting next to you as you demonstrate that for me. Because, and I don't want to say, well, you know, when I do it, it's fine. No, no. When I do it here on a specific printer, I get pretty consistent um, reproduction of what I see on my monitor. Anything that is not correct on print will not be correct on my monitor. So, so far, I really haven't had any any problems with that level of inconsistency specifically on a specific you know specifically on a, a certain i want to i don't want to use specifically again specific color like reds um i would look at my nozzle checks make sure they're perfect because that's a constant that needs to be kept constantly 100 percent. otherwise you will have a certain color ranges affected by you know in output So I really don't know. That's a tough one, my friend. I, I'm sorry I was not able to help you with a specific answer. Again, I would have to be like next to you. Mark Wagner, I'm using ICM and relative colorimetry. Yeah, that's a good, good way to go. Peter Yorth from Copenhagen is here. You're coming in a little late, my friend. I hope you've been watching uh, earlier. Uh, we're about to uh, go off the air, if you will, um, in a bit. Uh, Michael Fate says the Print Studio Pro and print layout installed just fine on my Mac. Yeah, Mac has no problem with it. I don't understand why it doesn't see like the current versions of Photoshop. And because right now I'm, I'm doing the uh, so called um, the, um, subscription. It does it automatically. It just it just updates automatically for me. So I don't know what the deal with that is, but it's always that window that you get that says that you're using an unsupported uh, level of uh, Photoshop. I'll I'll get it solved. I've done it before on Windows 10. Yeah, another Mac user says that they don't have any problem, but on Windows is a problem. There it goes. I, you know, people. I always complain about people using Macs having problems that are weird, odd. Yeah, Windows has the same thing, too. And uh, nothing you can do about it. <laughs> All right. So let me let me switch over to a different subject. I haven't seen um, Mike Cheney uh, shout out anything here during the uh, presentation. But here, here is my new little toy. Okay. And if you, if you give me a second, let me go get my original... Uh, Bebop 1. I'll be right back. Alrighty. So here's the original one. This is the yellow one. And you can see it looks a little odd, doesn't it? It's got zip tied landing pads. This thing, this thing can be dropped from 30 feet. As long as it lands in this orientation, not on this side, it will just bounce. It just bounces. No damage whatsoever. It's amazing. Now, I bought because I saw a video where normally the front of the Bebop looks like this. It's got the nice little and the fisheye lens and it says Bebop and it gives you the f-stop of the lens itself what kind it is and so forth and this little cover here protects the the um, nose cone of the drone 
and again i mentioned this to you guys this sells for like 89 bucks right now they used to be this and the sky controller one that big honking controller that looks like a space module that was eight bills back when it came out okay eight bills you can buy this for 89 bucks you can buy this sky controller for 180 right now even new so I am collecting these. These are out of production. They've been out of production for a while. They're still the most excellent way to learn how to fly. Okay, yeah, later on you can move up to a DJI, of course. But if you want to just spend under a hundred bucks, you can use your phone with this just right off the bat, no problem. So here's the catch. You see that? You see that lens? That is a 180 uh, degree lens, in other words. It's a fisheye, and so it extends beyond the front of the nose. If you bang onto something, you will damage your camera, and your camera will cost more than the drone, okay? So, in order to protect that, very simple process. All you need is, I went beyond what I needed to do. You just peel this off. It is actually just stuck with adhesive. Just peel that little cover off. It's made out of a really tough, nice, pliable plastic. And you have basically what is, what could be a GoPro lens. Same diameter, same everything about it. And the reason I say that is because then you can do this. Let me put this down. This is my little Frankenstein one because I've done a lot of modifications to this. So, check this out. This is a GoPro 52 millimeter filter adapter. I actually cut out, basically you're supposed to take this off and just put it away. And this mount fits perfectly over the current bebop mount just like that now you can install 52 millimeter filters how about that for fit you can dangle the bebop now i can bang the hell out of this it's 12 bucks is what this costs and it will not harm my camera in case you crash you know so that would be sort of a little funky way to protect your camera lens and also allow you to use like a polarizing lens while you fly. Yes, it looks a little odd, but remember that the Bebop uh, fake uh, gimbal moves up and down. This allows you almost complete straight up and almost complete straight down before you start to see the edges of the filter unit itself. Again, protection the ability to use filters where none existed in the past okay so that is the coolest thing i've been doing lately um i want to show you now what mike cheney made for me and these would fit on this and you may have seen examples of this in the past but he made me some that were done on ABS, I believe it was plastic, the the so-called um, uh, filament was ABS, and although it was very strong, it wasn't flexible enough. This one is, I don't know what he used for this. I'm not too familiar yet with the uh, materials or this, the, the plastics that you use on 3D printing. But basically what you do is you remove the little foot and this slips right in and it locks in place. Actually the other direction dummy like that and this gives you a nice little landing gear that will flex it will act like the zip ties but a little bit more elegant in other words so he made me six in case i break one of them what happened was the others um literally broke off and here's a little uh, cover to help you protect your camera when you're just packing it and moving it from one point to the other this is not as elegant as the Bebop 2, which is a lot better drone. But again, the Bebop 2, you can now... That was, gosh, close to $1,000 back when it was originally out. 
maybe four years ago. Now it's like one ninety nine for totally refurb units. You can buy these for one fifty nine, something like that. Brand spanking new in box, sealed, and so they're great little things to play around with, fly around, enjoy. Let me show you what the results I just got. I think it was one that I do that this afternoon. Rather windy out. I went ahead and put it up for just a couple of minutes just to test the actual lens. Okay, not this one, but my original yellow one. My yellow one is the oldest one. I got a red one and I got a blue one. Don't ask me why. I just love them. They're so easy to use. So let's go ahead and close this down. And we'll open up the video. And simply this is just about to take off. This is with the filter in place. It's just a UV filter. This is unedited video. It has not been color graded. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and go and look to the top. You see that? You see the edge of the filter. That's because the filter itself extends beyond the um, what would normally not show up. Now, I didn't test it going down, all the way down to the 90 degrees down. Again, it is a super cheap filter. I need to buy a better quality 52 ml, I mean 52 mm uh, ultraviolet filter. It came with a neutral density filter as well. But, you know, it's just good enough. I mean, again, this, this um, stabilization that takes place internally is quite amazing. Uh, simply put, once you Notice how this is something really odd. Watch this. I'm going to yaw to the left and then kind of boom. It kind of locks. And then, of course, I have some forward and backwards motion here. I was just trying to move it around as, as roughly as I could. I was not being gentle with it. And again, still the, the stabilization is just tremendous. And boom, it doesn't land. It doesn't land gracefully. That's for sure. So that is why there's so many modifications of the landing gear that you can apply, including that zip tie modification, which basically costs you nothing just about. You just buy, I bought them off of Amazon, a pack of zip ties. You need uh, some seven inch long and then uh, some uh, six inch for the rear, seven inch for the front and then a bunch of little short ones to tie it to the uh, legs itself. And again, it's very durable. It looks kind of odd, a little bit weird, but you know, it just lands. It just land on those, those little uh, zip tie loops instead of against the actual legs. And now it's very important you do not block the antennas that are on the, each of the four legs. So it gives you a really good range because you have four little antennas on there taking care of your uh, Wi-Fi. And uh, that's about it. So I'll be getting a lot more action out of this. Now tomorrow, like I mentioned, we're having a goodbye party for a good family friends of my daughter. So I will take the Bebop 2, the best of the Bebop family over there and I'm going to shoot some drony shots at the end of the party when everybody's still there hopefully before I, I get people kind of sneaking out I'll get everyone together we'll put them in the big front yard and we'll do a, a nice group shot from the air and they can all wave goodbye and uh, that'll be the end of that the end of the day for that so anyway let me see if there's anything else that we can cover here let's see what else on the uh... oh by the way I mentioned um, forums, so let's go ahead and look at my two favorites. The printer knowledge, and again, all of these you have to join, which is no big deal. And then the DP review, which has multiple different forums, having mostly to do with technology and mostly on the, on the photographic side. This one is uh, being... Um, moderated by an Irish guy. We call him the Hat. 
and uh, because he looks like a little leprechaun, that's his icon, his uh, little, uh, what do you call it, avatar that he uses. Again, mostly having to do with Epson and Canon, which is about the only two brands now. There's some stuff on Hewlett Packard and Lexmark and Dell and Brother. But again, most of the action is taking really place, is really taking place, I should say, on the Canon inkjet printers and Epson inkjet printers. So here, for example, what printer has replaced the uh, 3880? Well, to me, is the uh, P800. Is there any refillable model that prints A3? So people will ask questions and people will answer. The L1800, which is one of those cis-type um, dye ink printers from Epson, is around. It's in other countries. It was not really available in the U.S. that much. Um, but again, it's just using dye inks, and it's not the best dye inks in the world because it's sort of aimed at people who want to pay more for the printer because that's what you do. It's not a cheap printer price-wise. But then ink cost is going to drop dramatically because they're using relatively low-quality dye inks. And I think you just fill internal compartments with these inks. But if I remember correctly, they were using some sort of a barcode type mechanism to keep you from refilling, but I think that's been beaten already. This is uh, Mickling is Mike Lee, the owner of Precision Colors. So he does correspond with them a bit. And, you know, Mike, he knows a lot about all of the different printers. I'm very um, uh, lacking in knowledge. I mean, I'm I'm only knowledgeable of the printers that I do have at the current time. So I'm not your best guy to tell you about, say, older printers, different families of printers. Uh, that's why I go here to learn about these other printers. Now, the other best choice for me at this point is the DP Review. Lots of questions here. Join them, join them, and then pick the printer form. P800 or the Pro One or the P5000. Wow, let's see what they are asking. I'm currently using a P600 third-party ink tank system. I print every day, mostly A4 sheets, obviously Europe. The quality is just okay for me. Small details are unsharpened and just not good enough. Really? Hmm. I'm looking into the P800 and the P5000. I learned the P5000 head has 360 nozzles, plus 10, plus it has 11 colors. Is it the choice for me? Well, it all depends, right? Got to remember, that's the 4900, the dreaded 4900 that they revised. And so far, so good. I haven't heard any kind of problems. So anyway, you will find lots of questions like these. And also images that you can go ahead and browse and look. I get some of my images that I print through here. This one is basically that big. That is about 72 PPI right now. The way you're viewing this, let's go ahead and open it up. So this is, you know, you can print this, make a 5 by 7 of it, and you can test other people's work. And uh, let's see, you can go to the next one. Is there a next one? Yep. Lots of different images for you to play with, mess around with, see what other people are doing. They have challenges that they perform every so often. And so it's a very good good way to... to um... Uh-oh, wait a minute. What did I do? All right. There we go. We're back. So let's see if there's any more questions. Please go ahead and ask. I hear that our friend is here. We got about five more minutes here to go. So let's see. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Mike Cheney is still here. Great. Uh, Jeff Thompson says, are you using relative color metric? That was earlier. Yep. Relative is really meant for 
If you do not want to cause any color shifts on tones that are in gamut, then relative color metric. Tones that are out of gamut will just be pushed in, but the ones that are already living happily in that gamut bubble will not be shifted to allow the other ones to come in. Okay, so portraiture, uh, wedding shots, showing faces with skin tones, you don't want to shift those skin tones just to allow something bright red to come in, you see. Whereas relative, red, that's relative. So um, perceptual just causes everything to shift. Everybody move to the center of the room and the room is around, you know, amphitheater type place. So everybody has to go to the center of the room. They were shifted, you see. They were in gamut to begin with. They were made to shift to allow out of gamma color to be brought in. Okay. You don't want to do that with babies' faces or, or brides' faces. Skin tones are important. You want to keep them locked. So what good is perceptual? Well, if you print uh, oceanscapes, seascapes, landscapes of all sorts, don't do it for your logo printing because then your colors will be shifted. So that's the difference between two. That's a very simple, simplematic explanation, is that a word, um, of those two rendering intents. Jeff Thompson says to Mark, relative color metric may cause in gamut colors to shift. If there are other colors out of gamut, try perceptual. That's what I just said. Uh, Jeff Thompson says, scratch that, I have it backwards. No, 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 no. Uh, relative color metric will not cause colors to shift. Yeah, perceptual will. You were right. And I was wrong again, and then you realize you were wrong too. Yeah. See what happens? <laughs> Amos Canzoni says, How precise can you maneuver these drones? Actually, not, not in a forest between trees, no. Outdoors, wide open spaces. I can let my drone just sit there. I did that the other day. I said, I let it sit, and I found some weeds that were growing up on, on my pine tree, and I went to pull them off. I dropped my, my remote on my chair, and when I came back, the drone was still floating there, in the same spot I left it. They used GPS location to triangulate what their position is, and even if I just reach below and I grab one of the legs, I'll demonstrate what I mean. If it's hovering, and I grab one of the legs and I do this, it'll fight me, and it, when I let go, it'll come back and s situate itself back where it was. If I do this and, and, and try to tip it, it will fight me. You will hear a change in RPM of the motors trying to fight that and it will go back to its location. If I, if I had it low enough so that I can go from the top and push it down, if I let go, it will rise up to that particular altitude. Not perfectly. It's not as good as a DJI product like, you know, like a Mavic Pro or a, even a Spark. And by the way, um, Eli, I was going to wait for the Spark 2 to come out, but they have stopped the announcement indefinitely. So we were all concerned with the fact that what are they going to introduce into Spark 2? Will they have a 4K camera? Will it be more than just a two-axis stabilization gimbal? Who knows? So, you know, is it going to be a couple hundred dollars more? Who knows? But um, I had just finished watching uh, the Idaho quadcopter, I believe it's called channel. He took out his spark over to where was he at? In Las Vegas. And he flew it out and it, he, within like a couple hundred meters, it went out of range. And it would not, it would refuse to... Uh, come back, return to home. He was having all kinds of problems. And I think it, it was due to the fact that he was on a, like a depression and he flew over some trees and houses into another area. And he literally lost all the Wi-Fi. And I thought, wait a minute, so far everything went really well on the Spark. 
the the video was just primo i mean 1080p but just really really good really good 1080p okay and everything was just the stability was just rock solid but then he had all of these problems come up and i was like wait a second i was ready i was i swear to god i was ready to buy one at that point and then i realized that this is just the other day just two days ago and uh, i thought what caused this this guy is really experienced so i'm wondering maybe it was just an isolated you know situation in an isolated space or place something caused this to happen he was sweating bullets trying to get that thing back okay he didn't know whether it was going to come back or not and finally he was getting able to get it back and just in the nick of time because he was running out of battery and uh, really weird every time he tried return to home rth it would go to this um that he did not something i forget what the term was you know how the uh i the dji app talks to you you know yeah it was saying something back that was not being allowed to connect or something like that and every time he did it it would um it would repeat the same thing and finally by some kind of luck he got it to uh come toward him a little bit closer so that he can actually see it and that's why i always never I will never fly any of my machines beyond line of sight. I don't trust any of these systems whatsoever. Call me crazy. I just don't. So other than that, yeah, they're very stable. Um, it depends what you buy. Um, you could fly a non-GPS drone and you control it. You're controlling that sucker. If you let go, wind will cause it to drift. It does not have a hold to hold its position by triangulating where it is located via multiple GPS satellites. So it will drift. So you are in control. I have several of those types of drones, and that's where I, you know, where I learned to fly. So I think that's really the best way to go, because then you will not be so accustomed to everything being done for you automatically the positioning, the stability, you don't have to worry about, you know, obstacle avoidance, all of this stuff. You need to learn to do that on your own. I would not recommend flying between trees in the woods. No, it's, it's just too difficult. You will lose connectivity. You will have problems. And most of the time you'll crash. And at some point you'll ruin your drone anyway. So anyway, okay. I think we got... Someone from Greenland just came in, came on now. Oh, what a shame. We're about to sign off. We're a little bit beyond the three hour limit. Anyway, I hope that you can get um, to watch this on the replay later on. I know it's, it's late over there. But anyway, I really appreciate you coming on. I wish I could pronounce your name. Ulan Nak. Injun man, Injun man, Injun man. I, I know I butchered that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, terrible. Uh, but anyway, thank you for coming on tonight. And I, I, I welcome you and I hope you visit us again uh, in the future. We'll be on at five o'clock most Saturdays now, unless family uh, events get in the way. So that should alleviate the European watchers. And uh, so they don't have to stay up so darn late just to watch me. Mark Warner says, Wagner says, Jose, I did an also check and it looked fine to me, but I went ahead and did a cleaning. Don't worry. I have lots of ink in standby. Yeah, I, I don't know what that would cause that sudden or, or non-consistent performance on its, on whatever color. This just looks really odd to me. The cleaning didn't make any difference. He says, yeah, I don't I don't think it would. If you do have, absolutely have all, and this is a Pro 100, right? If you have all of the channels firing correctly, I, I can, it only points to the images because the only thing that would make me not think it was an image problem would be if the same image 
produce problems with red reproduction randomly. Say if you were to print the same image today and tomorrow and the day, the day after, and you get three different results, then yeah, that is not the image. Then something else is happening. Um, settings have to be dead on consistent every single time. Keep in mind that some settings default themselves to some default, not what you set them at. And if you take it for granted that they should still be the same as I set them originally, don't take that to the bank because they could unset themselves back to a default. If you did any kind of update of your OS, everything resets itself in most cases. So yeah, don't don't rely on that. Uh, QImage is great because it allows you to save jobs and it remembers every setting that you use, whether it was a default setting or something specifically that you set your driver at for that particular job. I love the way you can go back and recall that job two months later and print the same thing. As long as you got the same inks and your printer's performing the same way as it was when you created that job, you saved it as a job. You will pull up all the settings, even if you did it in, in, in multiple images from multiple locations, it will bring those images in, load them as the job, and you should be able to reprint that set of prints, that set of images, identically and get the same results you got the previous time. Okay. The guy from Greenland said, ooh, very good. Awesome. Mark Wagner, yes, I think it's the image too. Okay. Yeah, experiment. Try the standard image first. Try the standard image. Make sure that make sure that those reds are reproduced correctly. Anything else? Look at this red. I mean, look at this. This looks just like my monitor. And this is a crappy, you know, uh, JPEG I downloaded from the printer form. But you need to print that standard image. I can't even locate it now. Here you go. Print this baby right here. This is one you need to print. Print that. And uh, if you get nice, bright red strawberries, then you know. And then you print, let's just say, if you get the great looking strawberries, and then you print yours, and the reds are not so good, then is that. Then try another image and see if that's the case. It could be the the working color space of that particular image, whatever it is embedded at. And again, don't forget to check your settings. Don't forget, because they can shift on you. You turn off your computer, restart it, and when you check, everything's back to the default setting on the driver. You need to reset everything back to the original settings. All right, I think that is it. Again, thank you so much for hanging with me tonight. I'm going to have that black and white um, couple of videos co concerning how to do a conversion properly, okay, so that you maintain all your three channels, R, G, and B, but just simply everything's desaturated. I'll show you how to adjust colors that are now just being displayed as gray tones, how to differentiate between a green and a red, for instance, that's Mac next to each other, but they just have the same density, if you will. So you want to be able to differentiate between the two. Okay. In black and white film photography, we use filtration to do that in your camera lens. So nowadays, you know, hardly anybody does that. So lucky for us, when you convert something within Lightroom, you're able to have infinite adjustment possibilities of all of your so-called gray shades. So we'll cover that and then I'll tell you exactly how to achieve a consistent non uh, or lin non linear I was going to say linear linear or neutrally linear result on your black and white. The last thing you want is to have your darker tones being being reproduced a specific tonality 
In other words, maybe a little cooler than normal. And then your middles maybe will be neutral, not warm, not cool. And your highlights will be some other range, maybe too cool, okay, or too warm, or whatever. So you don't want that that level of non-linearity. You want everything to be exactly the same tonality. You can do that by fil by doing a, a profile, and you also can do that just simply using the the uh, so-called uh, OEM driver, not driver. It's getting late. The OEM ICC profile provided for you when you install your driver. So that should be fun. I hope to be able to do that this week. It'll probably be done middle of the week. We're going to have a very busy week next week with the kid, with Nathan, my favorite boy, other than my regular son. He is my number one boy, and Nathan is my number one small boy. I always have to tell him that, otherwise he'll get upset. All right, thank you so much. Don't forget to subscribe. Keep the subscriptions coming in, especially you viewers sitting on the fence. Subscribe. Commit to the channel. You don't have to do anything else. Let the ads run. Again, it'll be very, very random. And so it will not affect every single video that you watch. Not all of them will have them loading. So that's the way to support the channel. Also look at my links on my descriptions. Read those descriptions right below the actual video topic will be a list of links. Check those out. There's many ways to support the channel, channel there as well. Okay. And also some out of the external links to other services that I uh, promote, in other words. Oh, wow. Jim Porth just dropped a $10 super chat. I'm glad I hang, 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 hung on for a little bit longer. I appreciate that so much. Wow. Um, I guess I must have um, given you some, some information that you enjoyed. Thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate that tremendously. Mike Cheney, see you all soon. And good night. Thanks for the great stream. Yeah. So, Mike, thank you for the legs. I'm going to pop them on the uh, the new um, Bebop tonight. And we still got a little light outside. It's a little after 8, but it's still light enough for me to test them. And we'll see what we get. We'll try a couple of landings, and uh, I'll, I'll get back to you and tell you how they perform. All right, thank you so much. Don't forget to subscribe, share, and like, as I said. Happy printing, everybody. Let's play some music. <laughs>